morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number three hundred and thirty seven. Four hundred, four hundred, four hundred. Oh my god! Whoa, completely screwed that up. Four hundred and sorry, what are we again? Four hundred thirty seven. Seven. Yes, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yay! Do, 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 do. <laughs> Today, recording day, is Wednesday, July 31st, last day of the month, 2024. And uh, it's going to be uh, an okay day here at the Beaver Lodge. Right now, it's a little grayish outside, but I think that the sun will be coming up later. I'm your host, the Daily, Be- uh, the Daily Beaver, the Eager Beaver. <laughs> Pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? Clearly tripping over my tail and my tongue today. Um, <laughs> ah, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A uh, big thank you to goes to our podcast's founding sponsor, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Got a fun show for you today, hopefully. But first, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today? Because um, things have happened. Well, my mental health is um, just top-notch, A number one, spectacular right now. Yay. I uh, I have the rest of the summer off. I, I was laid off yesterday, and uh, I'm not I'm not upset about it at all, not in the least bit. Uh, largely due to the fact that uh, I've got a, a decent severance package coming my way. Uh, I, I might have to to uh, do some negotiating because yep. it it's a little less than it should be. So we'll we'll, we'll talk to that. I'm going to have my lawyer look over the package she sent me and and see. Yes, never but, accept uh, the first offer. The first offer is always a low ball. Of course it is. Same course. thing when you're dealing with an insurance company. First offer is always a low ball. Always yeah. say no to the first offer. I didn't say, I didn't say, I said, let me, I'll look, I'll speak this. I'll speak to my wife about it and look it over with my lawyer and we'll get back to you by Friday. So, oh, there's a doggy coming to see me right here. So, uh-huh. yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not upset by this at all because as everybody knows, I was not doing what I should be doing. Uh, the contract ended where I was, and uh, as it was not being resigned, they had me do service work for three weeks until my um, my vacation. And then when I got back from my vacation, I had actually my boss came down from Quebec City to meet directly with me and tell me in person he didn't want to do it over a Zoom call. He says that's wrong. He says I have too much respect for you. He says you're my best employee. He goes it's just uh, we don't have a space for you. I I anticipated this. I anticipated this a while ago. I'm like, they're not going to keep me in service for long because it's just, well, it's a waste of, of my talent, skills, expertise, knowledge, experience. And I mean, literally they had me cleaning class, which Mm. I'm not, it's the work is not beneath me, but it's like, you have somebody else that you pay to do that, that you pay considerably less than, than me for that, you know? And, right. and and that's not talking. I don't mean my, no, my no. coworker. It's just 
sending two people paid at X number of dollars per hour to do something that you should be paying one person. You know what I mean? Anyway, yeah. that's, it just, it, the economics didn't work out. So, uh, I have, uh, I've got the rest of the summer off and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about it actually, because as anybody knows, I wasn't, I wasn't miserable doing what I was doing, but I wasn't happy. Right. You know, uh, the thing that made it worthwhile was the fact that I was working with a, a really good guy and, and uh, our dispatcher was an awesome dude too. So, you know, I had a good team that I was working with, but we knew that it was just uh, an eventual, I knew this was coming eventually. Uh, I just thought it was going to be a little bit longer, but my boss said to me yesterday, he goes, there's no point in prolonging this, Paul, really? Uh, what are we going to do? Stretch it out over the summer? He says, I want you to have the summer off, relax take it easy. Uh, you can get your paperwork in order. He says, you've got time, you've got money coming in, you're going to be paid for the next while. So just take the summer off, enjoy it and, uh, keep in touch with me. You know, if you, if you don't find anything, maybe something comes up for you in the future here, you know? So uh, there's, there's so much stuff that, uh, there's so many opportunities for me. And one of the things that I will be doing now is, is really going full bore on this along with our charitable organization, the Mental Health Walk. I'm going to be talking to a colleague about that today. We'll, we'll uh, get things kicked into high gear. I'm going to be doing a lot more production work. I'm going to get back onto my jazz show, my music show, uh, my ASMR show is going to tick off, and um, I'm going to be doing some narration soon for Audible. So, yeah, lots of, lots of uh, pokers in the fire, and now I have the time to do them. So instead of working eight hours a week, now I can work 40 hours a week towards the goal which is building my production company up so yeah things are good all right good 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 well hey i, I love it <laughs> yes sounds like a great time for a podcast yes we did not have one uh in july uh, but yes we will definitely have a podcast in august at some point yes we and, will uh, <laughs> that was El Fox. I'm so proud of this guy, and selfishly i see this as an opportunity <laughs> for paul to refinish my kitchen floor yeah, it needs, uh, they need to get a big floor sander to do it. So first day vacation and the honeydew list gets an addition. Yeah, yeah. isn't that always the way? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> now that you're on vacation, here's some work. <laughs> so, so when we when we put up uh, this uh, above my head here, it's like it, this is not a hydration fund. This is the keep the show going uh, fund because you know I. Yes, I'm being paid for the next little while, but I got to generate revenue. I really do. So we got to generate more revenue so we can keep this keep this uh, boat afloat as the saying goes. So I'm going to leave that up there for the duration of the program for those who want to scan it. And if you are watching on the uh, on uh, the Twitter, if you're watching on Dean's feed, you can find us right here as it's scrolling across the bottom of the screen at youtube.com backslash at or forward slash. That's a forward slash. That's a forward slash. Yes. YouTube.com forward slash at True North Eager Beaver Media. You can find us on YouTube at that address. Please surf on over. We'd love to have you. You can join the chat with the best damn fam in all of podcasting. Register trademark. You said it. Mm-hmm. It's oh true. my God. And, and, and you're right here. They grow up so fast. <laughs> pa Patreon and membership. <laughs> um, so here's the thing about the memberships. For some reason, I cannot activate it. I can activate it on my ASMR channel. I've tried to activate it here. It doesn't give me the option to do it. So I don't know what that's all about. I'm going to have to check in with YouTube and see what the dealio is with that. But yes, I think we'll look at putting a Patreon together for this channel. So. And uh, my angry Speedo Man rants on OnlyFans might be coming soon. <laughs> Every time I say I'll start an OnlyFans, Bridget just gives me this look of... Speedo Man, tiny shorts, bringing you the news reports. Anyway. <laughs> well, something... Hey, we even have an episode called Speedo Man in Tiny Shorts. So <laughs> remember, That's I think true. it was after, after Pride last year. <laughs> Had that picture in the, the the tiny, tiny little booty shorts with the with the, the soccer socks that were up to the knees and oh, ooh, yeah. showing a lot of showing a lot of thigh there, Mr. Beaver. <laughs> well, ah man. All right, all right, all right. Get some cubs. Um in the news, uh, there's a uh, one big, big big, big thing in the news going on that's uh, uh, sort of <laughs> tangentially uh, related, well, related to Canada, but it, it's global uh, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's uh, last night uh, out in the Middle East, 
um, two um, senior um, Iran-backed operatives uh, were assassinated uh, by the government of Israel. Um, one of them uh, is essentially the considered to be the leader of Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, no, Hamas or Hezbollah? Was it Hamas? Hamas, both. Okay. Well, there's, there's both, someone in Hamas and someone in Hezbollah. That's what um, I thought, yeah. Yeah, so there were two. Uh, so the, the, a guy whose uh, last name is, goes by Hania, I can't remember his uh, first name off the top of my head because I just heard this as I was uh, um, logging in to, to, to put on the show. Uh, but yes, uh, he's uh, Hamas's political leader, Ismail Haniye is his name, and he was assassinated uh, while visiting uh, Iran's capital, Tehran, just hours after Hezbollah's top military commander, Fuad Shakur, was killed by an Israeli airstrike, airstrike in Beirut. Uh, so this is considered to be a really, really, mm -hmm. really big thing. I'm not familiar all that well with all the politics in that area, but based on what I've been gather able to gather really quickly this morning, like when I say really quick, like within 10 minutes of going, mm -hmm. I don't know if you call it on air when we're talking this, way, but um, Hadiya was assassinated on Iranian soil, which creates a big problem. Uh, so known as the political leader of Hamas, Mustafa Barghouti, who is a Palestinian politician, says, Quote, the Israeli crime for assassinating this man, Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas, will not break the Palestinian resistance or the Palestinian people's determination to achieve our freedom. Um, officials in Egypt, Qatar, and Turkey are warning that this incident could sow chaos and potentially a regional war. Iran's supreme leader is promising vengeance, claiming that um, they have a duty to avenge um, practically because, well, you know, it happened on Iranian soil. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Hania was the leader of Hamas in exile, but he was considered to be a more pro um, leading a more pragmatic faction of right. Hamas, but he did have links to the hardliners. He was a key channel. So um, for those out there who believe that uh, one of the biggest obstacles to peace in the region is Netanyahu itself, and he really doesn't want it to happen, um, this would probably go into your column. Because if you, I mean, yes, he's the political leader and you do want to take out a mass, that's what he said. Uh, but if you're also taking out the person who is considered a little more, well, someone you might be able to negotiate with mm -hmm. in order to re kind of scuttle negotiations, right? And ability to negotiate a successful ceasefire. Uh, Tom, I think things are going to really heat up before that happens, to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I don't. Oh, yeah. It's going to get proofing. much worse before it gets better. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tom Fletcher, who's the former British ambassador to Lebanon, says, quote, to have this guy taking out on their territory under the protection is a big provocation for them. And they will certainly dial up the rhetoric. But meanwhile, they will be selecting where and when they retaliate. Um, Hanie was indeed a central figure in the negotiations on the ceasefire. Peter Ricketts, uh, who, Peter Ricketts, who's a former British national security advisor, says, this in a sense gives Netanyahu the political room to wind down the political operation in Gaza because he can now say he's delivered a major blow against Hania's leadership. On the other hand, I think it makes it less likely that Hamas will want to settle. As well, as Mr. Grizzly mentioned, and as was mentioned in the attack um, south of Beirut in Lebanon, um, they killed Hezbollah's senior commander, Fouad Shakur. Uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Warren Austin says, uh, I don't think war is inevitable. I maintain there's always room and opportunities for diplomacy. Uh, I can imagine the United States is going, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. <Definitely. laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, according to CNN here, um, uh, while Israel claimed the strike in Shakur in Lebanon, uh, said uh, 
it will not, again, I don't know what it is with these websites. Literally, I will read you what it says. While Israel claimed the strike on Shakur, it hasn't done so for the Iran attack. Oh, claimed. Gotcha. I know what's me. Okay. So I was going like, claim what? Claimed responsibility or onus. So the government of Israel has claimed uh, responsibility for the strike on the Hezbollah leader, but has not yet said anything publicly, at least that's as, as of 21 minutes ago, with regard to the Iran attack. Uh, the military says, quote, it doesn't respond to reports in foreign media. Um, so what we do know so far, according uh, to CNN again, Shakur uh, was a military, senior military advisor uh, to Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah, considered his right-hand man and a member of the Jihad Council. The U.S. government had put out a reward of $5 million for information about him and his whereabouts. Hanie, as we told you, uh, was running the Hamas's uh, political operations out of exile and was emerging as one of its most visible leaders during the war. He was a key interlocutor with the, the international mediators and hostage and ceasefire talks. Um, Hanie was killed on the first day of the new Iranian president Masoud Pazeshkian's term. So, uh, while Israel is not claiming responsibility, well, the timing is kind of interesting. Hello, new president. Let's start off your presidency with a little, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. Right? So, clearly, uh, strategically, I guess this would be a move to destabilize. Um, I mean, strategically, if you wanted to stabilize, that's what you do, but, uh, uh, be careful the messes you make, because you never know where the stuff seeps out. Uh, boy. Uh, scrolling some stuff here. Uh, there was a um, the death toll rises to four uh, from the strike that killed the Hezbollah commander, so I'm guessing that there's probably uh, some in innocents civilians uh, that were collateral damage here. Uh, the former Iranian foreign minister says that Netanyahu is pushing the region to the brink of catastrophe. Uh, Javad Zarif is the foreign, uh, former Iranian foreign minister, quote, says, um, as the world is silently watching Israel's genocide and repeated acts of international terrorism and aggression, Netanyahu is pushing the region and the world to the brink of catastrophe. Uh, the cowardly association assassination of our guest will only strengthen our resolve to defend our territory and support the Palestinian people's fight for freedom, saying that it was high time for the West to stop shielding Netanyahu's madness and join the world in ending his suicidal chaos. Uh, President Biden uh, is alleged to have spoken with Qataris, his counterpart in Qatar, um, according to U.S. Secretary Anthony Blinken. Uh, Qatar called the killing of Hania, quote, a heinous crime and a dangerous escalation. Uh, uh, the Qatari Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Thani, Al Thani specifically said, political assassinations and continued targeting of civilians in Gaza while talks continue leads us to ask, how can mediation succeed when one party assassinates the negotiator on the other side? Mm, yeah. Listen, I'm not a big fan of Hamas and all that, but that is a kind of valid question. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, when, when you're trying to negotiate a ceasefire, of course you're negotiating with someone that to you is unsavory. But you got to do it. Right? So, um, yeah, this is uh, weird. Uh, Blinken has said that the U.S. was, quote, not aware or involved in the killing of Hanie and said uh, they would not speculate on the impact of the assassination. Uh, is, uh, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps says that Israel will face, quote, harsh response for the assassination, harsh and painful response. Undoubtedly, this crime of the Zionist regime will face a harsh and painful response from the power and great front of the resistance, especially Islamic Iran. Uh, said uh, that was a statement uh, from uh, the IRGC. So uh, that's about all I know at the moment. Uh, that uh, last little bit was uh, the latest update from six minutes ago. Uh, back here in Canada, uh, Global Affairs Canada has said that uh, any Canadians who are in Lebanon 
uh, should leave now while flights are still available. This is something that we said a few weeks ago that the issue uh, warning had put out. So if you are still there, if you did not leave the first time, do leave now. Uh, many European airlines are already suspending flights. So do leave now. Uh, greater than 20,000 Canadians are currently registered as being in Lebanon. And uh, the government of Canada says there's absolutely no guarantee, none whatsoever, that they'll be able to help with an evacuation if the conflict escalates. And uh, when somebody uh, lights a powder keg like this, uh, it could happen at absolutely any time and without warning. So again, if there are any kids and cubs here who are listening, who have family and friends in Lebanon, who know people who have family and friends in Lebanon, and they haven't heard the news yet, um, please tell them um, they got to get out. Now. Yeah, I spoke to a, a friend about that yesterday who works in that um, area, and he said one of two things may happen. Um, we might be sending people over to try and get people out, but it looks like that's not going to happen because of the way things are heating up and we're not going to put more people at risk. It's like if you can get out, get out now. We'll see what happens in the next few days. But whether or not we send over people to try and get the 40,000 Canadians out of that area of the world is a question. He said one of the things that happens, and it happened the last time, was suddenly, and this is not an accusation, this actually did take place, people would show up and say, this is my family, this is my, and they'd have like, these are my 47 children. I'm like, those, are, those aren't your kids. I understand what you're trying to do, but they're not your kids. None of them have passports. None of them have proof of birth. We, we simply can't take them because they're trying to evacuate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, because it's a bloody war zone. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a complex, convoluted situation, one that I am not an area, it's not my area of expertise at all. And, and how to manage it and, and handle it is not up to us, obviously. Right. We'll leave that to Global Affairs Canada. Uh, CBSA will be involved, and IRCC may as well may may also be involved heavily with that. But I, I don't know what's going to take place. It's uh, it's a sticky wicket, as the saying goes. Yep, yeah. uh, Mr. Grizzly, please keep talking. I got a sneeze. Oh yeah, you got a sneeze. Eh? Well, make sure you hit your mute button before you do that, because we don't want to have a sneeze in the ear. That would really. Uh, thank you. Here Appreciate you. that. <laughs> All right. Um, Back to other news, uh, Canadian news. Um, yesterday at the uh, Olympics, uh, there was a wonderful uh, medal performance from our Canadian women's rugby sevens team, uh, which was uh, absolutely fantastic because uh, they managed to get to the semifinal match against Australia. And uh, Australia is a bit of a powerhouse when it comes to uh, rugby. Yes. And uh, Astra, uh, uh, rugby sevens, for those who are not familiar with, uh, I believe it's uh, two seven minute periods or first 14 minute periods? Seven minute periods, I think. Uh, seven, halves. Two seven halves. minute halves. Correct. Two seven minute halves. And seven, uh, period. seven I'm thinking players hockey. per side. Seven yeah. players per side. So it's a very fast pace, uh, fast action. Um, and at the end of the first half, Australia was leading 12 0. So uh, two tries, one of them converted. Um, and Team Canada came back in the second half to defeat them. Yeah. They blanked Australia in the second half and beat them, which was a, a, an upset by any stretch. Uh, and then, of course, once again, because they played them in pool play, uh, they had to play the legendary New Zealand, New Zealand All Blacks defending Olympic champions. And, uh, well, the game went better, way better for them in the final than it went in pool play because uh, Team Canada, I think, Got their clocks cleaned in pool play. Uh, but at the end of the first half, Team Canada was leading. Yeah. Was leading. Just couldn't, just couldn't and then they started the second half and about 10 seconds into it, <laughs> New Zealand scored another try. And uh, yeah, uh, and pretty much from that point. It was largely expected for the most part. I mean, it was oh, yeah. kind of expected that that would have been the outcome. Uh, by By pundits, by sports pros, by betters, by pretty much everybody. It would have been great if Canada had been able to pull off a win and, and, and take home the gold medal, but it was not expected. It was expected that New Zealand would be victorious as they were, and they earned it. I mean, they earned it. They, and, and that's not a knock against Team Canada. They just took on the best in the world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they, came down close. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, like no shame in that game whatsoever. It's yeah. like when Mary Sophie Harvey finished fourth in the pool the other day mm -hmm. from lane eight, uh, doing her best possible time ever like, and, and by a lot. So, I mean, just, like I said, on the day, yes, I know it's about the medals. Yes. Mm -hmm. In one way. Yes. But if on the day in the moment you deliver in the clutch, your best possible performance, that's a win, right? The achievement of one's personal best mm -hmm. on any given day, on a time that it counts, is one of the ultimates in human achievement. And well, every uh, single one of us can accomplish that in our own ways, in our own lives. And winning a race in lane eight is very difficult to do. Very difficult in swimming because you get all the wake. Yeah, you get all the wake from like you lanes four and five are always for the top finishers because that's they're the best lanes to be in. Right. Um, lane eight, you're you're getting wake off the side of the pool, coming back at you, which slows you down. Yeah, and then the closer you are to the edge, well, of course. Yeah. That's where things gather, right? Uh, that's why there's usually that's why there's a lane on each side that's always empty, mm -hmm. like this to to help that. Um, so yeah, uh, a, a great medal, uh, fully earned. Much respect. Um, uh, there was uh, yet another uh, fourth place in the pool. <laughs> we seem to be the, the king's uh, fourth place. So that's our, our, our third fourth place in the pool. I believe it was uh, Kylie Maas uh, in the 100 meter backstroke, yes. and uh, Ingrid Vilm uh, finished sec uh, sixth. So great, uh, great results. Um, it was also a Canada versus Australia day all throughout the Olympics. And I see that. Uh, uh, Kit Pete, Aussie Pete is with us, and uh, we're sorry, <laughs> eh? Uh, but Canada defeated Australia in men's basketball, Canada defeated Australia in women's three-on-three -three basketball, and Canada defeated Australia in rugby. So, um, sorry, eh? Uh, <laughs> we like you, <laughs> we really do. And, and it's really weird because the day before, it was all our matches were against France for some reason. I think mm. we had a volleyball match and a soccer match and something, so... Yeah, there seems to be a theme for some reason. Um, today, also, uh, the triathlon did get to take place. They tested the water quality, and apparently they decided it was good enough. So uh, it wasn't a duathlon. The triathlon took place. We will see in a, about four to th three to seven days whether or not <laughs> that was a good idea. Because <laughs> if something happened, I'm guessing we're going to be getting reports a few days later. Oh, my God, what's this happened to my skin? said triathlete, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but so far, uh, so good. So far, so good. Uh, Remains to be seen. I, I'm pretty convinced that people will get sick from swimming in E. coli infested waters, even I though they say they're not. not. They, they're like, no, no, the, the levels are good. Okay. Uh, why don't you drink a glass of it then? Oh, Aaron Brockovich. Yes. <laughs> I love that you. scene in the movie. <laughs> we brought it in special just for you. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, given that we have a little time, um, let's talk about those opening ceremonies. If you want to, sure. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you watched them, Mr. Grizzly. Yeah, I did. Um, I watched them. I thought they were spectacular. I thought they were amazing. Oh, great. Um, Lady Gaga. Fantastic. Um, little known fact, people you might not know, um, the Lady Gaga portion of the opening ceremonies that we saw on TV was a pre-recorded one that they did earlier in the day. Mm. Uh, because uh, that's, the people that's were... commonplace for yes. something like that. Yeah. But uh, they were going to cancel it, actually, because they were oh. doing it. The plan was to do it live, and then there was the rain. Mm. And if you saw, it was a very, very tiny deck next to the water, and then there was all the stairs, and she had high heels and whatnot, and they said, like, she is going to slip and break her neck. So they said, you know, we'll cancel that. And she said, no, no, because I will show up early. We will do it early. We will record it because, and then we'll play it. Mm -hmm. um, so that part was not live, just so you know. The, 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 the vocal part was not live. And that's commonplace for something like that. Uh, you know, when, when a, everybody talks about Whitney Houston, who knocked it out of the park when she sang the national anthem at the Super Bowl in 1993, it was a recording. It was a limp, lip sync when she was live. She had recorded it like an hour before the show. So mm -hmm. that was her vocal. Yes. But yes. they recorded an hour before the show. The only portion that is done live when it comes to any type of singing is the halftime show. That's it. And in this case, the Celine Dion thing was live. Yes. 
Uh, but yeah. Lady Gaga was, uh, yeah, it, she had recorded it like an hour before the show or something yeah. like that. But Which, literally, it's understandable just because of the weather. There was yeah. issues. But in this case, it was it was like not lip sync. Like this was literally her live performance, just pre recorded for safety reasons, mm -hmm. so that you know, she didn't end up in the sand or breaking a leg. Because apparently, you know, it, it gets very slippery there. Well, um so and, and and you saw her like in the number like she's like running up those stairs oh, those yeah, heels yeah. right and like, didn't, you didn't want to risk it right yeah uh so yes exactly kit saucy gaga is an exceptional performer and the show will always go on mm -hmm. and she's and she remained like this you've seen her at the the gymnastics uh, uh yeah, yeah, all the time yeah. yeah um speaking of gymnastics hold on hold on hold on let's go let's not move yet let's not move yet um uh, so then mademoiselle celine Yes, yeah, she was great. My queen. Okay. Uh, now, people are wondering, like, why was she up there? Mm -hmm. Like this. One of the reasons she is up there is apparently uh, with her illness, um, uh, lots of stimulation mm -hmm. like this can cause things to happen. So they put her way up there. Uh, let's not mention that um, David Foster was there. Mm -hmm. 47-time Grammy nominated David Foster was there as well. He almost didn't get any mention or play, <laughs> but there were two Canadians there uh, that were doing great. Um, the rumors that she was going to sing La Vie en Rose uh, as a duet with Lady Gaga clearly was a little misdirection. Mm -hmm. uh, she sang Hymn à l'amour, Hymn to Love, uh, Edith Piaf's uh, classic. For those who do not know uh, the story behind the song, um, when she came to America to tour, uh, she was in New York. She met a boxer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Marcel Serran was his name. Uh, and though he was married at the time, they fell in love. I did not know. Um, and um, he was on a plane to Europe to spend some time with her, and the plane crashed. Oh. And that's the song she wrote. Oh, okay. Or that was written after that. I did not know. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, when you have, uh, the, there's the lyrics in French, but if the, there, there are English lyrics too, cause it's been sung all over, but you know, it's like, if the sky should fall into the sea and the world should crumble around me in my heart, you will remain there. I will sing for you my hymn to love. Right. So, um, when you know the story as I'm welling up thinking about it, <laughs> um, but also if you know her story, mm -hmm and her love for singing and performing. If you transpose the lyrics and apply it to her and what she's going through right now. Right. Again, waterworks. <laughs> um, Céline was Céline. Knocked it out of the park. Yeah, I thought she did a great job. Well, I, 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 I noticed that her, 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 uh, her voice isn't what it once was, but that mm -hmm. happens as one ages. She is 56, yes. so her voice isn't what it once was. But, I mean, the fact that she was able to get up there and perform was miraculous, because I saw her interview, and she could barely speak, let alone sing. She tried to sing in the interview, and it's like there was nothing there. So the fact that she was able to get up there, perform the way she did, was impressive. Because, let's put it this way, uh, Kelly Clarkson, who was mm -hmm. there, she's doing some stuff, said, like she was completely overcome, overcome and she was said, See, you have to understand that for us, mm -hmm. Céline is the gold medal vocal athlete. Right. So Céline, with not what, it is, not what it's used to, is still like Summer McIntosh leading by six seconds in the pool. Mm -hmm. She still wins. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Céline at 85% is still a gold medal winner in terms oh, yeah, of a local yeah. athlete, right? Yeah. Far and above everyone else. Um, uh, so, I mean, she's still got a, an amazing voice. It's oh, yeah. Not, I'm not trying to take no, anything no. away. It's it's because I, I did hear some chatter online about people going, she doesn't have quite... I mean, well, of course she doesn't. Even if she didn't have this syndrome, her voice would not be the same as it was when she was 20 years old because she's 56. Tony Bennett at 88 changes. wasn't Tony Bennett at 35. Exactly. Even though he was still knocking it out of the because again, at 88, some people lose the voice so much that they can't perform anymore. Mm -hmm. like, well, Frank Sinatra wasn't Frank Sinatra for the last 50 years of his life, I think. 
when Frank Sinatra in the 30s sounded like Harry Connick Jr. But as Frank Sinatra got older, because he smoked a lot and he drank a lot, it just, you know, he, he wasn't the performer that he once was. And that happens when you get older. It's just your, your voice is going to change as you get older. It's as simple as that. My voice is deeper now than it's ever been. So each year I get older, maybe I'll just drop a few more uh, octaves. I can so, hit the very white. Uh, at, at one point you're going to drop so low, we won't be able to hear you. It'll be like reverse my Uriah Carey. Yeah, I'll, I'll have like, to use the microphone at all times just to be heard. <laughs> She's got those notes that only dogs can hear. I don't know what at the mm -hmm. low register, what animal only hears those. <laughs> we just got uh, vibrations. Is all, is exactly. What, <laughs> what was that? Uh, was, Paul said something. I don't know. Let's see. He's typing it out on his phone. There. <laughs> uh, now, of course, um, there was, um, well, some people tried to manufacture some controversy of so course. basically throughout the 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 tabla uh, throughout the the scenes there were various tableaus and they all had names right mm -hmm. one of them was anxiety anxi anxiety one of, you know all that kind of stuff well one of them was called festivity mm -hmm. festivity and it's the one that created all the problems for people uh, because uh well basically um drag queens were involved so the scene opened with a whole bunch of people in front of the table and in the middle uh there was a dj barbara bush was her name or butch um who was uh spinning and it basically well, well, then the whole table became a big catwalk and there was sort of like a fashion show mm -hmm. now everybody is saying this that um that was you know they looked at it and says oh my god they're recreating the last supper with drag queens and drag queens. like oh my god how could you insult two four point billion Catholics and mock them and you wouldn't do that for Islam and blah 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 blah? Here's the thing. There's something that I call um religious narcissism. And that is when you are looking at things. And then you sit there and you go, oh my God, you choose to take offense because this offended my religion. The problem is, the world is a very big and nuanced and complex place. And it is bigger than just one person's religion. Mm -hmm. Now, people who are have a bit of enlightenment know that there's a lot of things in the catholic religion that do come that have a source in paganism so we're watching the olympics why would somebody think first that something going on has anything to do with religion when the olympics are based in greece and greece has mythology so apparently to the uh, religious narcissists um there is only one painting of note in the entire world that involves people sitting around a table so therefore it must be the last supper and of course because barbara butch had this round thing around her head oh they're making it look like the saintly hail actually it wasn't that was sort of a representation of the Statue of Liberty because, you know, the Statue of Liberty has a thing. And Gustave Eiffel, mm -hmm. that who did the Eiffel Tower, also did the Statue of Liberty and gave it to a gift, gave it to the United States as a gift. So uh, there was a, a tweet yesterday that, uh, well, I'm not sure if it was put out. Yeah, it was put out yesterday, and I'm going to put it up here. And uh, we're going to give uh, a, a little lesson here, Kits and Cups. So, uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will uh, put that up. Just a second. Let's go do a little uh, education here. There we go. Um, so this guy here. Look, you can try to spin it any way you want to save yourself, but it is what it is. At the start, it was an exact copy of The Last Supper. Hint, a pagan feast doesn't feature exactly 12 people at a table. And if it was Greek mythology, where are the, uh, the other Olympus gods? 
Now, you will notice that, of course, his picture is cropped here and cropped mm -hmm. here to show exactly 12 people. Yeah. Uh, I was not able to go back to the open ceremonies and see if there was other people standing on the line. Okay. You well, see the little round thing here? Let, let, so let's this... examine one thing, though, here quickly. The Last Supper was painted about 1,500 years after the Last Supper may have occurred. Yes. By Leonardo da Vinci. Who was gay. Who was gay. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. And it was his representation of what he thought it was. Yes. So... It, it's it not religious iconography. It's not. It never has been. It's a yes. fresco. And there was tons of frescoes painted in that style back then. Yes. It's not like da Vinci was at the Last Supper and said, okay, guys, hold it. <laughs> it's not a historical document. All right? And it's like, if you have problem with gay people being put, let's say it was the Last Supper mm -hmm. and these people were there. If you have a problem with that, shouldn't you have a problem with the painting? Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Right. So, and here's the other thing, right? Um, who hung out with the outcasts? Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you're complaining about this, you're basically telling us that you have a problem with everybody having a seat at the table. Yeah. Which is, again, the different, different definition, the difference between these days being, for some, Christian and being Christ-like. Now, if you would uh, put it back up, Mr. Grizzly, because there's a couple more visuals. You got to so, blow the picture up, though. It's really hard to see. Um, sure. Just click, click on the image. Just click on the image first. Okay. It should blow up. Yeah, it's a little bit. Right. Okay. So you have that. All right. Um, yeah, but now I need to get to the other things. Just, so. just close it. Just close it in the top left-hand corner. All, All right. right. There you go. So let's do a little culture. Look, you can try to spin it in the toxic religious narcissist way to cast yourself as a perpetually persecuted victim, but it is what it is. At the start, it was a copy of the Feast of the Gods painted by Dutch artist Jan Villiard. Mm -hmm. This is What's the, the painting. Yeah, that, what, that's now what look, it represents. Again, there's mm -hmm. a table. And a whole bunch of, oh my God, two paintings from back then that have a table? Who would have guessed? <laughs> So they see a table, they see people in front of it. This must be about our thing. Taking away the context. It's the Olympics. Therefore, probably first, it's not about religion. Probably first, it's about something mythology related to Greece. Then, if it were Greek mythology, he asked, where are the uh, Olympic go Olympus gods? Well, remember the guy, if you were watching the catwalk, there was mm -hmm. one guy dressed in black, black booty shorts and a black vest, mm -hmm. who was walking in black ballet point shoes, mm -hmm. walking on point. Yes, the whole time. Yeah, that's what he represents. Wouldn't that be the centaur? Yeah, exactly. A modern representation thereof. Okay. The fact that it is, the fact that there are many old paintings featuring people around the table. They verify. There are some insisting it must be and only could be the Last Supper, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the point I made earlier. Now, here's the reason, kids, because you know that uh, Republicans and conservatives hate these liberal arts programs at university. <laughs> why are we teaching liberal arts? Why do people need that? Well, here's a little reason why things like oh, art history matter. Just click on that uh, image if you could. All right. There we go. Appropriated from another post, somebody pointed this. Dear mm -hmm. friends, the headless woman was Marie Antoinette. She ruled over France and was found guilty of treason, conspiracy, and stealing from the country. Also, it was not the Last Supper. It was a depiction of an ancient Greek bacchanal. Because, you know, the Olympics are ancient and Greek. Surprise! And if you didn't know, a bacchanalia is an uncontrollably promiscuous, extravagant, and loud party. The parties often spanned several days, which honored the god of wine, Bacchus, the blue guy covered in grape wine. Mm -hmm. He is also known as Dionysus, the Greek god of fertility, later known as the god of wine and pleasure, or as some people would say, hedonism. Mm -hmm. And finally, it was not death on a pale horse. It was Sequana, goddess of the Seine, the river in which the boat procession took place. She was meant to be the representation of the Olympic spirit and of Sequana. If some of you weren't so busy trying to end the Department of Education, you might know this. Loosen the clutch on your pearls and get your panties pulled out of your mm, <laughs> backside. Yours truly, Lady Frances. And here's the 
bonus part. And this is the part that should have sealed the deal for people. Mm. Uh, oh, uh, is this the museum? Sorry. Yes. Uh, also, here, there was a tweet that came from the museum in which the painting's actually hanging. Yes. Saying, uh, does, this tableau, uh, does this tableau remind you of anything? <laughs> but, but here's the, the best thing. The tableau was called festivité. Mm -hmm. Festivity. To people who are choosing to take offense because you, you really bucked the Last Supper. Was the Last Supper a festive and joyous occasion? Well, not really. <laughs> it was supposed to be, yes. I understand what you're saying, but how joyful is it when it's the Last Supper? <laughs> you know? But yes, it, it was meant to be exactly that. Connect the dots, people. It's not always about your thing. The director... Thomas Joly, who put the show together, the artistic director, said, I was just trying to represent everyone. Mm -hmm. yes. And surprise, surprise, um, there are gay, lesbian, and non-binary athletes presently at the Olympics competing. Uh, Tom Daly, diver, just won a gold medal, for example. Quinn on Canada women's soccer team. Mm -hmm. That the previous Olympics became the first non-binary athlete to win a gold medal. Oh, that's true, right? Yeah. In history, that. or openly non-binary. So, um, you know, the Olympics are the place where everybody, all colors, all races, all ages, sexual orientations, gender identities, come and do give the best that they can give as a human. If you have problems with them being represented in the opening ceremonies, you have problems. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a you problem, and I do not see why it is that you keep on trying to make it ours. Well, if they're not bitching and complaining, they've got no reason. Yes. And here's the one line. Like this, this, oh my God, I couldn't let my kids watch it. No, no, no. So many kids were disappointed. Here's why this is BS. Number one, if you are to going to pre-decide to not let your kids watch the air opening ceremonies because they're going to be this degenerate, debaucherous thing that uh, recognizes that people who are different exist and you just can't cope and handle that, um, you'd have to know what was scheduled and what was going to happen. Now, as we just mentioned, they were telling us that Lady Gaga and Celine Dion were going to be seeing Les Villarros at the end, and that didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So often there are things to misdirect, or mis to misdirect you, get you talking about one thing so that you start. Um, there's probably very, like, the Academy Award decisions that show up, like with somebody with a briefcase, and probably the plans for an opening ceremony are probably the two things that are kept the most under wraps. Oh, yes. Nobody knew what was going to be happening, what was going to be said, who was going to show up with the performance. There is no way anybody at home could have sat there and said, oh, well, gee, before the opening ceremonies, I would have let my kids watch the opening ceremonies, but I couldn't because there was going to be all that gay stuff. You didn't know there was going to be all that gay stuff. No, no, you did not. That's a lie. You hear that going through? You hear anybody on any of that discourse? So I couldn't let my kids watch it. My kids were so disappointed. You didn't let your kids watch it because you were too busy to freaking watch it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Get off it. Nobody deprived a child of anything. You didn't know it was going to happen. Like this. If you were upset, it's because your kids saw it. It's because you were watching it live in real time and then you saw it happening as it was happening. And you go, oh, shit. You did not know before. You did not launch a preemptive strike. There was no family anywhere in the world that said, well, you know, Johnny, you know, Mariella, we really would like you to watch the opening ceremonies, but there's going to be some stuff that you're just not allowed to see. So, sorry. That never happened. Now, um, you, noise got so bad 
and lasted so long because, of course, these people never let anything go, never admit the wrong. Uh, that's uh, an official uh, from the Olympics had to go out and had to give some type of explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody pointed out, uh, you will notice that she did it with a, a little bit of a tiny smirk the entire time. Like She's like, I can't believe I have to do this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, basically, it was uh, there was no intent. The artistic director said there was no intent. That was not his vision. And it was pretty much a, an I'm sorry if you were offended, which uh, somebody goes, well, that's not an apology. But I know. What was the <laughs> scientist said years ago? I, I can explain it to you, but I can't make I can't understand it for you. Right. So, no, normally I say, like when when somebody needs to give you an apology and says, "I'm sorry if you were offended," no, no, mm-hmm. don't be sorry if I was offended. Being sorry you offended me. Mm-hmm. So basically, the French, the people there, basically issued and were sorry if you were offended. People goes, that's not an apology. Like this, and somebody like I said to her says, "Yeah, I know." We know. <laughs> so um, th- there's a, a little bit I- in the in the the subtle French way, a little bit of nail file. <laughs> okay, I guess we have to do this. So to shut y'all up. <laughs> but it, it's really once again amazing how the fuck your feelings crowd need really the whole world to stop. This, yeah for their big feelings. Seriously. So, hopefully, now that they came out and did that, it will die down a bit. And then we can actually stop having to hear them talk over the games. Mm -hmm. It's like, could you shut up for a while? I'm trying to watch water polo here. (laughs) (laughs) Or can you complain during the break at least? (laughs) <laughs> Jeez, man. These people. It's it's just never, ever enough. Never enough. They're exhausting. Um another thing that's going on, kids and cubs, uh, this one is a bit of a hoax, uh, because you might see it going around. Uh, there's a screen cap that's going around Twitter, uh, from uh, allegedly from Elon Musk. Uh, stating that um, weird, the word weird, is now a slur. And if anybody uses it like this to mock uh, Republican Party supporters online, uh, there will be severe punishment. Now, it seems that that is either a hoax, it's an, either a generated tweet, or maybe it was something that was up for a couple of seconds and you took it down. I don't know. Um, but as far as I know, it's a bit of a hoax. Interestingly enough, uh, you're going to you start seeing it um, online. You'll see Republicans are weird, lots of hashtags. And you're starting to see it in Canada. Polyev is weird. Conservatives are weird. Wacko conservatives. Conservatives are wacko. Those types of things. It seems that uh, the democratic movement in the United States have finally found an attack that sticks And that is driving Republicans crazy, crazy. And I think you'll remember that I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ronald Rump roast was at one of his rallies. He's going, I hate it when people laugh at me. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it when people laugh at me. And like, we're we're now because it was that press gallery dinner when Obama was president, where there were a couple of jokes at your expense that got you so triggered that you decided to run for president and destroy the whole damn country and world. This whole thing's a temper tantrum because he couldn't stand being laughed at a little bit by a black man with cameras rolling. Um, literally, this is why we're going through all of this. Um, now we're going through it because he's trying to keep his orange ass out of jail, but it all stemmed from the fact he didn't like to be laughed at. So, People are wondering, it's like, well, say, we've called, we laughed at them. We call them deplorable. We laughed at them. We call them cruel. We laughed. Yeah, that doesn't work. They wear that as a badge of honor. But weird, weird for some reason needles them because weird is not chastising them or admonishing them. It's mocking them. Why are you doing that? That's so weird. Why are you being weird? Normal people don't do that. <laughs> you weirdo. <laughs> They can't stand that. 
And people are wondering, like, why is that connecting? And the best way I can describe it is think of the difference between being punched in the face and being slapped really hard across the face with an open hand. One of them's way more insulting, isn't it? Oh, yes. Right? The punch lands with a thud. Punch. Oh, so he hit me. He was able to take a punch. Look at him. He took a punch and got up. But a slap across the face. That's like, you're not even worth me closing my fist. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> it stings. It stings. And that's why this is resonating with them. It stings. Because they know it's true. They know it's true. And they don't like being called weird. Deplorable. The, the whole parade from themselves. The parade of the deplorables. Look at us. Ha ha ha. We are unconventional. But weird? Weird makes you an outcast. Right? Weird is the, uh, no, sorry. You can't sit at this table. All the seats are taken. But there's 12 seats and there's only you here. Yeah, but, but people are coming. Weirdo. <laughs> So that seems to be connecting. It's gotten under their skin and they are losing their minds and I am here for it. So you're wondering what that, well, all that stuff that's going on, that's it. They finally found, went on the offense and found something that sticks, something that drives them crazy. And listen, they're not helping themselves. You had JD Vance out there yesterday saying something like, I wanted my wife to come up and say something like this, but if I did, she'd make me sleep on the couch. On or with the couch. Uh, so, dude, as a former PR strategist, when there is a fake story going on, mm -hmm. and it is a fake story, but hey, a lot of people are going, hey, if Republicans say that Hillary Clinton was running a pedal ring in the bottom of a pizzeria, we can say you screwed a couch. Deal with it. <laughs> we, at least we know it's a joke. When we say it, you guys took it seriously because somebody showed up there with a gun ready to shoot up the place. <laughs> when that is going on, you rented a guide in a backpack for a five-day trek in the woods to make every effort possible, not to mention anything having to do with couches. Dude, what are you doing? Now that they're talking about childless cat ladies who are destroying the world, and if you don't have kids, you should have like, like all these things are weird. They're objectively weird. So anytime they do something, anytime they talk about one of their positions, like, we're going to make it illegal for you to cross the state. It's like a, that's weird. Mm hmm. It could be applied to anything. Exactly, Mr. Jim. Weird equals outcast, and we all know what they do to outcasts. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to hear a lot about that because, um, as you know, in politics and stuff like that, um, this concept of find the spot on the body where when you press and makes people say, ah, and when you find that, Stick your finger in there. <laughs> Go. So you're going to see, be seeing a lot of that, and you're probably going to see a lot of Republicans losing their minds. Um, things are going well, by the way. Um, people are saying that the last two weeks in the United States is the biggest two weeks that they've ever seen since the days of Kennedy with regards to a Democratic candidate in terms of gather, gathering and rallying support and being unifying. Um, there are reports that, meanwhile, while uh, Donald Trump has spent over uh, $80 million or something like that trying to defend himself, Kamala Harris has already raised $200 million. Uh, so I think uh, she already has, they already had a war chest from Biden, mm -hmm. and now she's got an extra $200 million in it. Uh, and I'm going to guess that she's probably still spending money from the war chest on Biden hasn't even touched any of that 200 million yet. Whereas uh, Trump is going through money like it's well, oxygen. And that whole statement that um, 
Elon Musk going to get was going to give him forty five million dollars a month, and then he went psych. <laughs> <laughs> that's not actually happening. So I think that's kind of funny myself. Yeah, uh, you know, Biden stepping down. I didn't know what the response was going to be. I, I honestly didn't know. Me too. How, I thought there was, was going to be a war. I thought they would turn around and say, well, no, we can't let her lead. We need to have a, and then there was going to be this whole thing trying to deny the black woman. Yeah. Which would have well, they're trying to do that anyway. the party. They're trying no, to do Within that. the Democratic Party. Oh, yeah. within the, okay. Yeah, they just well, rallied the Republicans the are, Republicans are definitely trying to do that to her, but they're failing miserably. And at the oh, yeah. same time, she has uh, risen in the polls and all of a sudden there's a new hope in that nation I think she's going to win a landslide victory. And of course, Trump will say, no, it's, it's not true. He, he, if he doesn't win, it's because somebody else cheated, according to him. Yes. And speaking of a new hope, it seems that uh, Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker, is all in for Kamala. Oh, yes. Kamala. So uh, actually, there's been some talk. There's been some talk of uh, Mark Hamill and Linda Carter. Luke Skywalker and Wonder Woman may be... Um, going to the Democratic convention and doing a joint speech of some kind. Isn't our friend James going to be at that convention? He was just at the Republican. Yes, he is. Yes, he will be. Uh, no. Um, well, he was thinking of going, um, but uh, I, I had a chance to speak with him on the phone. And uh, because he, um, the assassination attempt oh, happened, gee, yeah, that changed um, a lot of they turned around. Yeah. People. So he was not able to uh, get the press credentials right. um, to get as close as he wanted. Uh, and, uh, uh, apparently, he uh, as as a um, determined and inter intrepid uh, news seeker would try to do. He tried to get in in the different other ways, which led to his uh, cell phone and uh, computer being temporarily confiscated. Uh, so he wasn't able to do much work <laughs> while he was there. Uh, so yes, I I think he's uh, reconsidering whether or not he'll go because. Uh, he's assuming that if security was tightened at one, security might be tightened at the other. And uh, going just to hang out in your hotel room is not particularly interesting, especially if you're looking for a story, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll see what he uh, ultimately decides. But uh, yeah, that's the thing going on there. So uh, yeah, if you're just sort of like tangentially paying attention, that's kind of the stuff that's going on there. People are losing their minds and it's, uh, <laughs> again, people are being weird. There's, there's just no, no other way to say it. I've got a story for you here that I'm just right. reading of that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, Let's do it from the Olympics. Egyptian fencer uh, Nada Hafez announced in a heartfelt Instagram post that she is seven months pregnant. Pregnant. She just competed at the Olympics the day before. <laughs> Dang! Way to go, Mama! Wow! <laughs> way to go, Mama! Yeah, no kidding. Yes. That's, now I that's, uh, that's tough. <laughs> yes. Now I think earlier you were going to say something about uh, gymnastics, Mr. Bruce. Yes, we were watching because uh, it, it did take place yesterday, but we watched it last night, the uh, women's team event, and mm -hmm. um, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, so I'm looking forward to it. Mademoiselle Simone Biles was once yes. again, yes, just just an unbelievable performance. Yes. Her floor routine is ridiculous. The height she gets. I know, speed, right? It's outrageous. Her vault, she she was so fast when she hit the vault. She landed it perfectly, but she bounced back on the landing. Like she stuck the landing, but literally bounced backwards because she had so much power behind yeah, her. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So yeah, it was quite something to see. It's, it really was. That woman is insane. Yeah, yeah. There's no other, there's no, there's no, I don't think in our lifetime we will see another gymnast like her in our lifetime. I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -mm. She is a generational athlete. And at 27, she's still outperforming everybody, which in gymnastics is old. Yes. I mean, there was that one uh, woman from, I think it was bulgaria a couple of years mm -hmm. ago like this was in her 40s whatnot managed on like on, on one apparatus because she was an apparatus specialist who didn't manage to get um a bronze medal or something but yeah i mean this is a sport i mean this is a sport most people quit when they're like 23 24 yes. i mean ellie black from canada she's was 28, 28 yeah and at her fourth olympics which is like rare because she's not just an event specialist i mean she's doing the whole thing still she does the, yeah, at, at 28 around. Yeah. all around I this um she's like everybody's like talking about, oh my God, I can't believe she's still here. 
it's like 20 is not old, but for gymnastics and like in most sports, the ages are getting older, right? And swimming people are peaking in their late twenties and tennis. I mean, Djokovic was like 37 and still winning. Mm -hmm. Like people are peaking later and their careers are longer, better health, better medicine, better medicine, training, training. better preparation, all of it. Um, And genetics is a big play in that. I mean, Simone Biles is genetically gifted for the sport. Yeah, it's like it's, 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 Michael Phelps is to swimming what Saban Biles is to gymnastics, what yes. Michael Kingsbury is to, you know, his sport. I mean, there's just, uh, Rick Federer was to tennis. I mean, it's I mean, just, Michael Woods Kingsbury was to golf. Is, is the athlete who has won, his winning percentage is something like 68 or 69%. Exactly. Which right. is, even the greatest athletes in the world come nowhere near yeah. that. Like Ledecky is to the 400, like, I mean, they're just, right? Yeah. The, there are there are athletes, right? Ali, Ledecky, mm-hmm. Woods, well, and, Williams, and somebody I think we'll be talking about for a long time, Summer McIntosh, who is just a generational athlete. Yeah, she this, just turned seventeen. Yeah, right? the last name alone. Yeah, and you know it. You know what everybody's talking about. Yeah. Well, Alexiak. I mean, Penny was sixteen when she won a gold medal. She wasn't expected to sh- get a showing, let alone a podium, let alone a gold medal top of the podium and and she uh both her her and maggie are part of the four by uh 400 meter re- is a four by 400 meter relay team i, I believe think yeah they're be. on the team and and uh maggie had dropped out of a race yes her uh, yesterday free i think yes she dropped out of the 100 meter freestyle and people were criticizing her for it and i'm like no she's doing this for her team she yes. wants to win the the relay Yep. So she says, I'm going to bow out so I can be rested and prepared for this. I'm like, this is somebody who is a team player. Mm-hmm. And, and Penny uh, didn't qualify for some of the individual ones, but she was as part of the four by 100, but the, the relay team, she's definitely a part of it yeah. and is bound and determined to win the whole damn thing. Right. Right. Exactly. So uh, as Devin Haru pointed out, because a lot of people making the criticisms like, oh, well, she took somebody's place. No, no. she did not take somebody's place. Yes, to, to get on the team. To get on the Olympic team, there are national trials. It's not the national championship. There's actually a special event specifically. Swim trials. One day. One opportunity. Because throughout the year, you have an opportunity to meet the standard. Like this, if there's an Olympic standard, there's a time you got to meet. If you do that, you're in because you've met the standard already. But if you haven't yet, there's one day. Mm-hmm. Olympic trials. You've got to go there. You got to finish top one, two, or three in the race, and you have to be under the Olympic qualifying standard. She is the only one that made the Olympic qualifying standard in that category, in that race. There was nobody else. There is no young girl sitting at home in Canada saying, Oh, I could have been there if it wasn't for Maggie. No. No. Because not only would you have had to compete at the the trials, meet the Olympic standard, or have met it previously during the qualification period, then you would have had to go there, swim the preliminaries, and be among the 16 best Olympians in that category before. Mm -hmm. And because she pulled out, there was another athlete, not from Canada, but that Mm -hmm. did get to take her place. That's right. So nobody was denied anything. In fact, somebody that didn't make the semifinal got to make the semifinal from another nation and she got their literally moment. she took one for the team literally right so um bashing maggie smith maggie mcneil uh, maggie smith oh. maggie mcneil maggie mcneil why am i thinking of the dowager <laughs> from downton abbey oh my god <laughs> madam sorry bashing margaret mcneil no no come on no that's not happening um, Mr. Grizzly, I gave you a link here. Yeah. Uh, uh, now this is another thing that's going on because we were talking about Simone Biles. Uh, when we're talking about Republicans and conservatives being weird, uh, you will notice that they often like to talk about Taylor Swift, mm-hmm. right? There's a reason for that, right? And um, this lady, Tracy Foran, mm-hmm. who we're talking about from the CPC, she did that in her own way the other day because uh, um, she, she was going basically. after... She was basically going after Guy Felicella. Yeah. And, and, at one point. 
Yeah. Because, but she's been blocking everybody after like about like 30 minutes, one hour. It was like, oh, you're not going to agree with everything I say 100% and you are going to dare ask me for accountability or to prove something or to clarify my statement or if you ask me to question, actually provide a direct answer. I like somebody, Hugh, Hugh was interacting with her. She actually had unblocked mm-hmm. you, Hugh and I for a little bit. Because, and then we went again. She says, well, says Hugh says, I asked you many questions. I didn't see any questions. So like, we went back and says, here are all the questions he asked, which you did not provide an answer. Like this. And four times he asked, him, what is your policy to deal with the issue of drug use mm-hmm. in the writing at Esquimalt? Asked him four or five times. She says, I already answered, look for it. She doesn't have an answer. And she didn't. She didn't answer. Like this. And then blocked everyone again. I, I expect to be blocked by her later today because I called her out on, um, she, she rambled on about freedom of speech. I'm like, if you are a serious candidate, you should know that we don't have freedom of speech in Canada. We have freedom of expression. It's decidedly different. It has regulations and rules around freedom of expression. It, there's limitations on it. You don't seem to understand this. You should not be running for office. Yes. Now there's a lot of people that, um, uh, are finding that they've been pre-blocked because essentially uh, uh, she scanned the hashtag uh, women against Polyev mm-hmm. and basically just went on a pre-block of anybody. If you use the hashtag, she's blocking you. Because she's also demanded that Elon Musk suspend the accounts mm-hmm. of people, which he has done uh, for uh, white men for Kamala Harris. Yes. After I, I, they raised about $4 million like this, he suspended well, the there's, Well, there's two, there's two different accounts with very similar names. And one was blocked because it looked like the algorithm picked it. it he didn't block them. Okay. The algorithm picked up on it and thought it was a spoof account. There's yeah. similar names. There's uh, white dudes four, number four, Kamala. And then there's white dudes, F-O-R, Kamala. And the algorithm picked it up as a spoof and blocked one of them. Okay. That's what right. took place. And I'm, guessing I'm not defending them. Elon Musk, but he had nothing to do with okay. this. And I'm guessing the wrong one was blocked? I don't know. One of them was blocked. I don't know which one it was. Okay. I can't remember. Somebody explained it online and said, here's what took place. Okay, good. You know, so it was not Elon who did it. Okay. Even if he wanted to, it wasn't him who did it. It was the system that flagged it. And that happens sometimes. Okay. So yeah, apparently she wrote an appeal to him. Like, yes. you know, basically trying to, so clearly, um, she literally just wants to hear from people. Who say, oh, yes, 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 Tracy. Like this. But my point is on this one is that Everyone she blocks within half an hour to like an hour or whatnot. But Guy Felicella, she mm. kept going on him for 24 hours. Yeah. Why the different treatment for him than for everyone else? It's the same reason for which Republicans keep on mentioning Taylor Swift. It's the reason for which that one really wacko Republican at some point uh, published a story trying to say that Dolly Parton's gospel of love everyone is some fake thing. She doesn't hate anyone. Yeah. So, I mean, you're basically crying because, well, everybody on your side, well, everybody hates someone, so she can't be real. It's like, That's, she doesn't hate anyone. You're projecting. Cope. <laughs> Deal. Right? But the reason people do this is because they have very, very, very low name recognition mm-hmm. and they just want to and go. if they latch on to someone else's coattails who has greater re- re- recognition either by praising them or whatnot or by taking them on mm-hmm. goes, i'm not being mean i'm just calling the kettle black it's one of tracy's boron's favorite lines yeah, yeah. Uh, because then so you look at her followers you look at the amount of followers guy felicella has mm-hmm. she just wants like to this. ride his coattails Mentions his name, trash talks him, gets the engagement. Oh my God. Hey, this Tracy girl, she's on our side. Like I actually had one person respond to a tweet that I said, right, she's a vile woman. Oh, great. That means I'll follow her. Okay, wait a minute. You know nothing about her except that she's abusive and vile and that's enough for you to want to follow her. Well, I guess that person figured, you're well, weird. I pissed, off, I pissed off the lefty, you know, the lefty's pissed off. So this must be who, you know. It's like, I don't understand people. Even if you like people who piss off lefties, it doesn't mean that that particular person is a person who's worth a follow. Yeah. Right? People are talking about like, you have probably, you can't stand people who have different politics than you do. Um, 
no, I have tons of friends who have different politics than I do. So do I. Right? That's not a problem. I have not a problem with different politics. We're still friends. We just don't discuss politics. <laughs> I have a problem with ugly is on the inside. Mm -hmm. So even if you share my politics, like there's certain people who are like, you know, there are pro-trans rights, uh, mm -hmm. but they are doing and saying things in the name of that that are... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I hear you. And doing yeah. things to people. So even if you share my politics, if you are fugly, mm -hmm. I don't want you on my team. And well, if and, you don't share my politics, but you're not fugly, you can sit at my table. And we've discussed in the past for individuals that uh, are, are for, you know, going out protesting those protesting drag shows and, and, and trans kids. And it's like, okay, good, you're doing the right thing. You're just doing it in the wrong way. Do I, am I telling you how to protest? No, no. I'm not, but I am telling but you, you're doing it in the wrong way. And we're telling you, you're not helping. You're not helping. <laughs> you're not helping. You're you're, not all helping. you're doing is fueling the fire that's raging on the other side of the fence. You're help, helping them, not the people you're trying to represent. So yeah, you're certainly welcome to protest and, and we're not going to tell you how to do it, but we will tell you when you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. So let's play this again. File under Republicans are weird. File on some frickin' nobody trying to ride coattails and willing to say the most ugly things about other people. Now, I'm going to preface this Ugly one. on the inside. Ugly on the inside. Anti-corporatist. That's what he's talking about. Ugly on the inside. Not, yes. not, not, no. not this. No. Not this. Ugly on That's the inside. Yes. Just get, look, we need to preface that and make sure everybody understands that. When you say ugly, ugly on the inside, not yeah. a person's ugly, physical appearance. Ugly is always on the inside. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it ends up seeping through the pores and you can see it in someone's face, mm -hmm. but ugly is on the inside. That's right. Always first on the inside. Mr. Grizzly, if you would. Well, just, I just wanted to, to uh, give you a momentary palate cleanse here. Oh, okay. As we got a little. Mm. Hello, little, Lady Lola. A little. A little puppy dog asleep here, right Aww, beside me. Such a cutie. <laughs> like a such a cutie. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. In there. Okay, so let's let's switch it over and we'll have a look at this video. This is a Trump endorsed Republican nominee for North Carolina Governor Mark Robinson. Okay, have a look at this. This is bizarre behavior. Let me just see. This might be really loud, so bear with me. I'm worn out. I'm tired. But here it is. Whenever I think about being worn out, being tired, you know, somebody get this on uh, on their phone and probably end up on Facebook. But what she wants? I don't want to be to quit when you go and get stuff. <laughs> <laughs> My generation cut from a different cloth. You know, I don't quit when you go and get stuff. Been plenty of times when I've been in the car, tired, dog tired. What time I to go back home? You see, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm not like somebody out there flipping around on TV on some monkey bars out there trying to get a gold medal for myself. I'm doing this for a bigger talk. I'm wore out, I'm tired. But here it is. Whenever I think about being wore out, being tired. Okay, I've had enough of that. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to say something. Probably you, some are going to get that on Facebook. Break out your cameras now and make me go viral. I'm not trying to just do it for myself and try to win some gold medal, but please post it so I get my clicks. Oh, I got a, I guess. Some weak little gymnast. I want to say thanks to Cassie. Cassie just sent me this. I'll put this on the screen right now. Let me just blow it up for you. Uh, this is breaking news and I think I will show this quickly because it's related to what we've been talking about pretty much all morning. Uh, the court of arbitration for sport has dismissed Canada's appeal of FIFA's six point penalty against its Olympic women's soccer team. Hmm. So that's it. So they, they have to, win. uh, they have to win their next match in order to stay relevant and stay in the tournament. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, weak little gymnast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Simone Biles. Yeah. Who can't? We've all seen her when, massive thighs, right? <laughs> who can't hack it when things get tough? She had twisties. 
Yeah. Which that's is, when your inner balance goes off in your head. You can't tell which way is up when you're in the air, which is how she, you can get killed in gymnastics. And she does what she does. Mm-hmm. The way that she does. With the height and speed and velocity and force that she does. You are not quitting when the going gets tough. And I'm like, really, absolutely just st- like, this is a black man. Mm-hmm. Cutting down a black woman who is a hero to millions. Like, here, people who are people's heroes are there. Kelly Clarkson is there. Snoop Dogg is there. Mm-hmm. Lady Gaga is there. Tom Cruise. All these people that a lot of people admire for being their achievements in their own rights are there admiring her. I am sorry, uh, candidate for governor, but um, if you are going to come after the Lady Simone, mm. you are going to have all the gays up your backside faster than you can Yeah, stay. she has an army of supporters too. Yeah. High bar. I am. What again? Weird. Normal people don't do this. This is weird behavior. I don't. The misogyny is just incredible. And on that, um, in that uh, alleged last supper scene, the lady who was uh, the DJ, apparently. Uh, she has filed stuff in court because the level of abuse that she has received. And uh, I learned a new word called uh, grossophobic, which is, I'm guessing, I've never is heard that before. Yeah, insults, uh, probably based on size. Mm-hmm. So, but Barbara Putsch said, a lawyer for Barbara Butch said the DJ, quote, has been threatened with death, torture, and rape, and has also been the target of numerous anti-Semitic, homophobic, sexist, and grossophobic <sighs> insults. Butch said she had been the target of, quote, cyber harassment, adding that the messages she was receiving were increasingly extreme. So, um, yeah, she has uh, gotten herself a lawyer, and... Uh, uh, the lawyer said, she is today filing several complaints against these acts, whether committed by French nationals or foreigners, and intends to prosecute anyone who tries to intimidate her in the future. Butch also posted a statement of her own on Instagram stories, writing, whatever some may say, I exist. Mm-hmm. I've never been ashamed of who I am, and I take responsibility for everything, including my artistic choices. All my life, I've refused to be a victim. I won't shut up. She said that she was extremely honored to perform in Friday's ceremony and added, my heart is still full of joy. And uh, a lot of the performers, I did not know that, but in that scene, you know, the whole RuPaul's Drag Race thing, Mm -hmm. that has gone across the world. There are franchises of that all over, I guess. And a lot of those, these people weren't just, you know, oh, we're mocking or whatnot. These are professionals. The scene featured drag queen Nikki Dahl and former contestants from Drag Race France. So these are the best of the best Mm -hmm. again in their field on the world stage. You may not like drag, you may not approve drag, approve drag, but again, there is skill, there is talent, there's an art form, and these were the best of the best that were there on a stage where we honor the best of the best. Just Mm. I, I don't get this. Just, uh, Some people just got to hate. Yeah. Now, uh, let's address the DJ for a second here. I, I saw a lot of chatter online about people going, that mixer's not plugged in. It's not, it's not. The mixer was a representation so that people would know there was a DJ. They didn't plug it in because it was pouring rain, you idiots. It was a USB plug-in stick that was powering the sound system. That that mixer was there just to represent the DJ. That's it. It was the music the DJ had pre-mixed 
in advance. Just like 99.9% .9 of the DJs you go to see at EDM festivals, they plug a USB key in, press play, and then twiddle the dials. The DJ in that instance, in the piss pouring rain, that mixer was a representation of what a DJ does. You can't mix on an electronic device in the rain. It won't work. People are so mm -hmm. damn stupid. Mm -hmm. And I don't, there's a, there's a group that I love, a musical band from England called Faithless that I like. Mm -hmm. That has a song called God is a DJ. Mm -hmm. No, I know the track. This is my oh, church. This is where I heal my hearts for tonight. Yeah, the 12 God inch. is a yeah. DJ. So, um, because if you really want to get blasphemous, um, mm -hmm. Jesus is a woman. And she's a DJ. And she brought some church to the opening woman. ceremonies. <laughs> so, um, I know like, that pisses off a lot of people. Uh, Jesus, God was, is a black woman. And God, Jesus that wasn't big white. black lesbian in the sky in a wheelchair who's a single mm -hmm. mother. <laughs> I don't know, it really screws them up. She looks like Oprah. Yeah. I know. Well, that's she talks to piss me. off a lot of people. But you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing for the believers, for the believers. You, you don't know what your God looks like for the believers, for the non-believers, you don't care, but for the believers out there, and there, there's millions of them, you don't know what your God looks like. You have no idea. So if, if you think God's a white man, well, to you, he is. Do you think God is a black woman? Well, to you, she is. It's like Santa Claus. Nobody knows what God looks like. Nobody. So settle down yeah it's like i remember it's like god is however relationship with your higher power is supposed to be personal mm -hmm. and however it is you imagine that higher power in your mind is what it is it's not for somebody else to tell you what that is that's yours that's for you That's for, that's for you. That, that's your thing. That's your garden that you nurture. That's for you. Nobody else has a right to tell you what that is or what that isn't. Just too many people are not minding their own damn business. Yes, unfortunately. Yes. Now, yeah, uh, I, I brought up that article, uh, Mr. Grizzly, just wanted to, uh, about the... Uh, the court of our arbitration here just to make sure oh, that there's I have, a... I have something here about that actually um okay go this, ahead this, this is interesting uh, let me just bring this over here where it's easier for me to read fifa had evidence of canada's soccer's historical spine program soon after assistant coach joey lombardi was arrested by french police canada soccer provided fifa's discipline committee with head coach bev priestman's e emails as it considered sanctions after a Canada soccer analyst emailed Priestman four months ago to say they refused to spy on opposing teams, closed training, Priestman emailed a human resources consultant on March 20th, 2024 to ask for advice. Priestman email, seeking your advice and input here regarding this formal email on spying. It's something the analyst has always done, and I know there is a whole operation on the men's side with regards to it. It can be the difference between winning and losing, and all top 10 teams do it. Wow. That's what you call a blockbuster. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Where did you get That's that the, one from? Was that from TSN. the Global article? No, it's from TSN. Oh. And and this is, uh, I'll put the, a, a link in the chat here. Please as, do. As, as discussed yesterday in terms of the spine conversation, this is from Bev Priestman. Uh, I came off the meeting with the clarity you understood my reasons for me be unwilling to do this moving forward, the analyst wrote. Morally, my own reputation within the analysis field potentially being unable to fulfill my role on a match day. Moving forward, I will have a discussion with Joey Lombardi and reach out to the wider tech team with regards of how we could potentially look for other solutions, but just wanted to confirm that you will not be asking me to fulfill the role of spying in the upcoming and future camps. Priestman sent an email to external human resources consultant who works with Canada Soccer on the same day. And that was the email I just read here. She wrote that a different Canada Soccer employee had worked recently with her staff and he was outstanding in this area. Yesterday in a meeting when discussing, I asked the analyst to propose an alternative solution as for scouting. It can be the difference between winning and losing and all top 10 teams do it. 
Canada Soccer provided the analysts and Priestman's emails to FIFA. The Federation also wrote in the FIFA document that it believes the spine program began with John Herdman, who coached the women's national team from 2011 to 2018 and the men's team from 2018 to 2023, and who now coaches at Toronto FC. Priestman worked as a technical assistant and an assistant coach under Herdman from 2013 to 2018. Herdman told reporters in July 26 he is confidence, confident his teams never spied on competitors at the Olympics or World Cup. Herdman has said he will cooperate with Soccer Canada during its probe. We suspect that the practice of using a drone stems back to John Herdman when he was the head coach of the women's national team. Canada Soccer wrote to FIFA on July 27th. According to the FIFA document, in other words, this was a practice started by one person, John Herdman, and continued by Bev Priestman. It was not facilitated by the Federation. New Canada Soccer Admin is supporting a full independent investigation of the issue and has already taken steps to ensure that the scouting tactic does not happen again. Wow. Well, that kind of uh, would explain why it is that John Herdman was first to come out with that preemptive strike and make sure that uh, he was labeling that as scouting. Mm -hmm. Once again, I will repeat, Kits and Cubs, Scouting happens through the front door. You show up at the event or you show up at the practice and you are standing there and you can be seen and you are allowed to stay and are not asked to leave. Well, the federal government said it plans to withhold some funding from Canada Soccer and the Federation said it will commission an independent third party investigation. The results of that investigation will be public, Canada Soccer said. <clears throat> Priestman, in a statement through her lawyer, apologized on Sunday from the bottom of my, of my heart and has said she will cooperate with the Federation's investigation. So, yeah, there's, um, there's, there's I, I, you know what? This, this goes back to Ben Johnson, right? Why did Charlie ask the fan put Ben Johnson on the steroids through Dr. Uh, Jamie, what was the, I can't remember the doctor's name, but uh, Charlie Francis, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Jamie asked a fan and Charlie Francis, yes. why did he put them on the steroids? Because everybody that was competing was pumped full of them. The only way to compete on an even keel was to be on steroids. Mm -hmm. He spoke about that in the Dubbin inquiry. Mm -hmm. She's saying all the top 10 teams do this. Mm -hmm. So they were just trying to be on a level playing field, but Canada got scapegoated once again. Once again, it's, it's literally the Ben Johnson thing all over again. It, it literally is. Now, here, here's the thing. Though. Here's the thing. Uh, the difference between uh, Ben Johnson and this. Is, yes. And this is key. This is key. Ben Johnson got nailed for a steroid he was not taking. Mm. They okay. found a banned substance in his urine. Well, it wasn't. Somebody put that there. Yeah. That's been that's been talked about for decades because yes. he was not on stanazolol. Right. He wasn't. The doctor. They had taken him off that almost two years prior because he didn't like how it made him feel. So that the, the steroid that he got nailed for was not one that he was on. And the doctor and the coach came forward and said, oh yeah, he was on roids, but he wasn't on that one. So somebody doctored with the sample. Now at the time, uh, doping control back then was very lackadaisical. Anybody could walk in and out of that room. Anybody could walk in and out of that room. And it was proven that there was a guy who later came forward and stated he, he, he tampered with the sample. There's a documentary a few years ago. A guy came forward and said, yeah, I did it. I did it. He says, I was paid to do it. Carl Lewis was, was, <laughs> he was loaded with steroids. You don't believe me? The man had to get, um, braces in his late forties because the growth hormones that he was on caused his jaw to protrude out. So he had to get his teeth fixed via braces in his late forties because of the steroid damage he did to his body when he was younger. Mm. Speaking of Carl Lewis. If there was anything for me that was controversial about the opening ceremonies. Yeah, why was he there? Yeah. Like, they had like legendary, legendary athletes on a boat carrying the Olympic flame back to, to the dock mm -hmm. on the Seine so that it could uh, start its journey to, uh, to the actual place where it was going to be lit. And uh, there was Serena Williams, yeah. understandable. Mm -hmm. Rafael Nadal, king mm -hmm. of clay, winner of 14 French Opens while they're mm -hmm. in Paris. In Fran Clearly, I get that. Um, uh, Nadia, Nadia Comaneci, Nadia Comaneci uh, world's best, best gymnast, probably 
other than Simone Biles. Well, she changed the sport, right? Different eras, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, she wasn't doing triple double twists because the the technology, the sport wasn't there. But I mean, you think women's gymnastics, you think Nadia Kamenich, you think Simone Biles. Yes. Right. Um, She was there. And then Carl Lewis. Yeah. I get that he's a famous Olympian, but I I get that he got four gold medals in one Olympics track and field because you know he was a long jumper as well yes but yeah and he was trying to break bob beeman's record but yeah. never did but we all know we all know <laughs> we all know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah oh well thank you uh, for 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 bringing that up uh, uh mr welcome. grizzly um according to this thing in global here it says the court of um, arbitration for sports had its panel of three arbitrators rejected the appeal by the Canadian Olympic Committee in Canada Soccer following a closed-door hearing on Tuesday. Arbitrators said that they would publish the grounds for the decision at a later date due to the urgency of the decision in a statement that came less than eight hours before the Canadians are set to face Colombia at the Paris Olympics. So that match is today, by the way, kids and cubs, if you're, you want to send some good energy and some good vibes to help carry them through. Uh, the COC in Canada Soccer issued a joint statement thanking the court for its quick work. Quote, while disappointed in the outcome of our appeal, we commend the players for their incredible resilience and grit over the course of this tournament and look forward to cheering them on in today's match against Colombia, they wrote. Governing body FIFA docked six points from the women's team after a Canadian staffer was caught using a drone spy on New Zealand's team practices before the start of competition at the Paris Games. The COC in Soccer Canada had asked the arbitration court to cancel or reduce the points deductions, arguing it was disproportionate and unfairly punished the players when there was no suggestion they were involved. Canada Soccer was also fined more than $300,000, and three team members, including head coach Bev Priestman, were suspected for one year. Three coaching team members, not soccer team player members. Um, the decision means the defending Olympic champions remained in a must-win situation against Colombia if they want to reach the knockout stage of the tournament. Uh, and uh, Canada is attempting to reach the medal podium for fourth straight time after winning bronze in 2012, 2016, and then gold in Tokyo three years three years ago. Um, Canadian defender Ashley Lawrence said Tuesday that the team was keeping its focus squarely on winning the game. Quote, we can't control it. We can only control getting the win, she said. That is our motivating factor. We want to go into the game 100% to blow it out of the water and win. Eighth-ranked Canada has defeated number 22 Columbia in both previous meetings, but those matches happened over a decade ago. So um, there you go. That's uh, the latest news that we have on that. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, I did manage to uh, find uh, that thing from Tracy Foreign. Oh, did you? Uh, Yes. This is uh, what she wrote. She's counseling. She really, she doesn't even have the nomination yet, right? Mm-hmm. Because she's trying to secure the nomination. So uh, what better way than uh, to try to suck up to the leader? If you would like to read it, Mr. Grizzly. Pierre Polyev, CBC, CPC. If you proactively block every post and person with the hashtag women against Polyev, it should reduce the volume of tweets coming at you. I found a correlation between this hashtag and the attacks. I'm sure it won't stop them completely, but give it a try. It only took about 30 minutes to get them all. Elon Musk, not sure what the uh, solution on this one is, but these kinds of coordinated attacks need some method of mitigation. Very tiresome and distracting. Detracts dramatically from the platform. So uh, we have a woman here that is saying that women saying they're against Polyev need to be silenced. should be suppressed suppressed speech uh since then the hashtag woman against polyev has been trending a little bit of a streisand effect there but literally literally that is incredible wow we got Mark, uh, Mark Des, 55. I'm running for the CPC, but I don't want your vote blocked or your vote blocked. Yours either blocked. Everyone on that hashtag don't want your voter to change your mind blocked. It's a hell of a way to run a campaign. I'll represent all of my constituents, except blocked. for the ones who disagree with me. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely astounding. Um, I do not know, again, weird. 
Yeah. I, just I, weird. Uh, Tavi G sent me something earlier. I'm going to show you this because it's it's like whoa. Uh, I I don't know. This is from uh, just about uh, uh, well 7:46, so a little over two hours ago, or an hour ago, I guess. Anyway, this just have a look at this. This is from Bob Ray. Oh. Um. Wow. Um, the election in Venezuela, Venezuela is not simply tainted or dubious. It has been stolen by Maduro. And he is now arresting opposition leaders and hundreds of others. Ugh. Dozens have been killed. I'm like, oh eef. Yeah. Eef. Yeah, that's uh, something that uh, there were elections in uh, Venezuela. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, uh, hopefully I'm able to, to find it. Uh, but uh, Pierre Podiev uh, got involved in a little um, foreign election interference. Well, hang on. Before we go to that, I, I, I want to read this retort or reply to, to Bob Ray, which is interesting. He says, it, this is from uh, Benny Selleck. And where exactly are, are you getting this information, Bob Ray? Are you in Caracas? Are you speaking to regular Venezuelan people? The U.S. has been attempting coups in Venezuela for years because the U.S. wants the vast Venezuelan oil deposits, which are estimated to be twice the size of Saudi Arabia's. Chavez thumbed his nose at the U.S., and now so is Maduro, so every attempt is being made to oust him. I sure hope you're doing your homework here, not just following the U.S. script. Like, hmm. Interesting. Hmm. So, uh, I, don't, I don't have an opinion on this because I don't really, I don't know enough to make a comment. So... Uh, we have like I just I don't know <laughs> this here uh, from PP uh, now of course Anida originally Venezuelan mm -hmm. so um, there's this thing from uh, the New York Times that has the Iron Lady of Venezuela threatens to unseat its autocrat and um, Pierre Paliev decided to tweet this Iron Lady Maria Karina Machado is fighting to free her people from socialist tyranny. Let the people vote and democracy prevail in Venezuela. This literally is foreign interference. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you don't support Madero and whether you would want to change it or not, this is foreign inter This should not be happening. No. This should not be happening. So, um, yes, there was a quote, skippy air quotes, election mm -hmm. in Venezuela. And according to the CBC, uh, protesters took to the streets across Venezuela on Tuesday, holding marches and waving flags to demand President Nicolas Maduro acknowledge that he lost Sunday's election to an opposition insisting it clinched a landslide victory. The protests, which the government denounced as an attempted coup, began on Monday after the South American country's electoral authority decided that Maduro had won a third term with 51% of the votes to extend a quarter century of socialist rule. The opposition, which considers the election body in the pockets of a dictatorial government, said its candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, had more than twice as many votes as Maduro based on the 90% of vote tallies it has been able to access. At least 11%, 11 people have been killed in different parts of the country since Sunday's election in incidents related to the count-associated protests, the right group Foro Penal said. And uh, this is uh, posted yesterday at 11 a.m., so uh, the numbers uh, may have been adjusted since then. Uh, Maduro, 61-year-old former union leader and foreign minister, won the election after Hugo Chavez's death in 2013 and was re-elected in 2018. The opposition said both of those votes were rigged. He has presided over an economic collapse, mass migration, deteriorating relations with the West, including the U.S. and EU sanctions that have crippled an already struggling oil industry. Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino warned against allowing a repeat of the, quote, terrible situations of 2014, 2017, and 2019, when waves of anti-government protests led to hundreds of deaths and failed to dislodge Maduro. Independent pollster called Maduro's victory implausible, while governments in Washington and elsewhere in Latin America questioned the results and urged a full tabulation of votes. Not even Maduro believes the electoral scam he is celebrating, said Argentina's president, Javier, Javier Millet. Peru ordered Venezuelan diplomats to leave within 72 hours, citing serious and arbitrary decisions made today by the Venezuelan regime. But in a familiar global division, allies including Russia, China, and leftist-led Latin American nations backed Maduro. Uh, 
Quote, China will, as always, firmly support Venezuela's efforts to safeguard national sovereignty, national dignity, and social stability, and firmly support Venezuela's just cause of opposing external interference, Chinese President Xi Jinping said in a message of congratulations. I will be honest with you, kids and cubs. I don't know anything about that situation there, so I cannot add any additional commentary that would be that would create any value added whatsoever. Um, so all I can do is uh, read to you uh, what was in the story and give a little idea of what went on um, and what the Canadian connection is, is that you know our leader of the opposition um, decided to uh, engage in a little uh, election interference and quite a bit of conflict of interest, considering the family he's married into. Um, but hey, rules are for suckers, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, Alberta. Yeah, we can go for a few more minutes. I gotta, I gotta be, yeah. I got a meeting shortly. Um, I know Smith. I'm not, I'm not employed anymore, but I yeah. still have meetings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel Smith, um, the whole box seat thing happening. Oh, um, luxury suite for the playoff game. Yes. Yeah. Luxury suite. That, that's running in the background. And, um, I think it was, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, Nate from, uh, the breakdown, mm-hmm. Alberta, um, posted, uh, a little clip of her speaking, uh, about it. She was asked a question directly and, um, it was just utter, utter nonsense. What she said. Um, yeah, I'm reading some of it right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, there was, a two. Yes, this is the one here. Um, so I'm going to give it to you because, uh, audio doesn't work through me so that you can play it. Uh, Mr. Grizzly. Um, Nate said Smith on Saturday was asked if she had issued a gag order about the Skybox scandal. She responded by ignoring the question and said admit she accepted a Skybox seat from an organization that is lobbying her office, which is literally the definition of corruption. Uh, now there's a clip here. It uh, goes for a certain number of seconds, uh, but it's actually, uh, Mr. Grizzly, um, the clip actually has her saying it twice back to back. So um, if there's uh, anybody listening, if you hear a little bit of repeat before we cut it, uh, that's what's going on. The, the, the clip itself was edited uh, to uh, to to play it uh, twice in a row. Premier Smith, last week, the Globe and Mail reported that several ministers and staff attended Oilers playoff games this year in a luxury box of the company that was contracted to import that huge shipment of children's Tylenol, 250,000 bottles of lower strength pills, as I recall. The optics sure don't look very good. It's like the company said, hey, buy all this medicine and we'll reward you with some primo seats. I know that's very simplistic, but aren't there rules around this kind of activity and why isn't anybody talking, even though you've asked re- uh, reporters to talk to ministers directly? Has there been some kind of gag order issued? Well, I can tell you what I did. I mean, I, I went to, to BC uh, to deliver a, a jersey to David Eby, and uh, a, a member of my board of Invest Alberta hosted me. Uh, the Oilers hosted me for a game, and the Explore Edmonton hosted me for a game as well. And I'll look into this to see if there is any concerns that the Ethics Commissioner has about um, the receipt of, of, this, uh, of these kinds of tickets. I think people got excited about the Oilers playoffs. I think people wanted to support the team. But if there's any additional rules that, that we need to put in place, then I'll I'll take the advice and we'll change some we'll we'll, we'll tighten up some of the rules. Okay. So much bullshit. Okay, number one, uh, awfully nice of the person asking the question to just blunt the system. Well, I know that seems a little simplistic. No, no, it doesn't seem. If it seems simplistic, it's because it is simple. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> it's so so nice because I'm going to ask you the tough question, but let me blunt my tough question by saying while I'm asking the question that the criticism is a little simplistic. Look, I'll tell you what I did. Oh, so you're not going to answer the question. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what I did. I went to deliver a jersey and then a member of my board invest alberta that was probably an unfortunate choice of words um remember that uh kids and cubs invest uh, alberta is the board to which uh she just named former premier allison redford 
who got the boot because of the Sky Palace. So <laughs> she, she brought in someone who was thrown out for being corrupt to be at the head of Invest Alberta. And they were involved with that. Now, a lot of people were excited about the hockey. Mm-hmm. How, is that, how is that relevant in any way to you being there? Not a lot of people. You were excited about the hockey. And you were particularly <laughs> excited about luxury seats. Because, hey, I guess when it came time to go to the hometown classic, which is a pretty big deal, Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you couldn't be bothered because you weren't allowed to sit your delicate, soft little tushy in the box seat for the whole match. So only your ethics commissioner then said that you could only stay there for 20 minutes, which already is pretty unethical in the first place like this. But that wasn't good enough for you. So you decided not to go. I can't be treated like the queen that I am, so I will not show up. Now, ethics commissioner, you said I couldn't do that. Well, I don't like that. So um, you're fired. And hmm, these rules say I can't. Well, I don't like that. So I'm going to change the rules. So I guess if there's something with the rules, I'll ask the ethics commissioner that I had put in to replace the one who said something I didn't like to look at rules I changed in my favor to see if there's anything wrong. And if they need to be changed, I'll just change them again. It's okay if I do it, but not if you do it. If I do it, it's okay. There was a... a She's weird. There was a Q&A with uh, Daniel Smith hosted by the Calgary Law Heat Constituency Association yesterday. And uh, Katie Teeling uh, at Teeling Cat on Twitter uh, sat in for it. And, and you've got to hear some of this. I, I'm going to read a couple of, of, of things that, that came out of this. So before the question period begins, um, Smith provides updates to the crowd on what her government has worked on so far. She mentions ending vaccine mandates, not raising taxes, overhauling Alberta health services, and growing key Alberta industries. She talks about the Sovereignty Act and how the provincial government has had to use it twice so far on the oil and gas emissions plan and energy regulation. And this is the one that I went, what? Smith says, in quotes, I'm sure you've heard that they've banned cow farts in Denmark. I'm sure if they could get away with it, the federal government would try that too. You can't ban something from farting. (laughs) She's weird. She says she'll continue fighting for Albertans until Pierre Polyev is the next prime minister in 2025. She then discussed COVID-19 vaccine measures Not saying that UCP are planning to update the Alberta Bill of Rights in the fall, amending it so those who refuse medical procedures like the vaccine cannot be discriminated against. Because remember, according to her, the most discriminated people in history were those who chose not to get vaccinated. You know, the gay community, uh, the trans community, uh, any person of color yeah, in North America who would like to have a conversation with you, Danielle? First Idiot. peoples would love to have a word. Yeah, you think? I think they've been pretty uh, uh, discriminated against, uh, you know. Uh, here, go live on this land. What? Oh, yeah, y- you have to live there. You can't leave. You don't own any of it, and you can't own the home that's on it. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. You need a special pass if you want to leave. Yeah. That was a thing. That was a thing. It was apartheid in this country, and it's not that long ago. So yeah, um, she's, she's got a big mess on her hands with that one. The other thing, Alberta, is um, the fires. Jasper. She says it again here. Oh. One more thing. She yep. also says that freedom of speech is also a future priority so that the gag orders put on Albertans and Canadians by the liberal NDP coalition ends. Okay, that's just a whole pile of bullshit. There's no again, gag orders. again, we do not have freedom of speech in Canada. We have a protected right, which is the freedom of expression. Get it right, you dumb idiot. Number one. Number two, there is no liberal NDP coalition. There never has been. It is not a coalition. So she can't even lie correctly. Uh, this woman. Even her lies are lies. <laughs> she says that Alberta will never adopt safe supply measures because they do not believe there is such a thing as safe supply of heroin and that safe supply measures just give addicts drug, drugs until there is no hope in saving them. Wrong. So here's the thing on that debate. 
The debate isn't drugs versus no drugs. The debate is fentanyl and benzo-laced drugs versus safe supply. They don't want to discuss the direct question, the drug supply, regardless of your moralistic stance on drug use. The drug supply has been poisoned. Yes, you can start with the position that drugs are poisoned to start with. Yes, fine. You can have. We already it. have a safe supply of drugs but, that we can buy at the corner store. Right. Soon, it's called beer and wine and, and cannabis and cannabis. Those are all drugs. There's a safe supply. Right. So the concept, they want the concept to be drugs bad, drugs are poison, drugs are killing people. Yes. And in normal circumstances, even without fentanyl and whatnot, yes, drugs have ruined many lives. Mm-hmm. But now it's like, hey, I take one hit, boom, you're dead. Some people who are getting their first taste don't even have a chance to become addicted. <laughs> Boom, something happens. The supply. Somebody put poison in the supply. And if you're like that Tracy Fornan woman again, who says that all harm reduction policies are failed policies, when we know for a fact that when it comes to safe injection sites, for example, I think Insight specifically, 55,000 lives at least have been saved. No one at a safe injection site in Canada, anywhere, at any time, has ever died of a toxic overdose. They're calling that a failed policy. What other conclusion are you supposed to draw if you say that that's a failed policy, is that those 55,000 people shouldn't have lived, should have died. Mm -hmm. They did not deserve to live. That's the issue I had with Tracy Foran. Yeah. Are you trying to tell me that you yep. considered a fail policy that 55,000, the lives of 55,000, either adults, addicts, or recreational users that happened to get some bad stuff and whatnot, were saved? Mm -hmm. She doesn't seem them worthy. Because I have a problem with that. If you are, your position is that there are some people in society who have an illness because mm -hmm. addiction is an illness, don't deserve to live, you are going to have a problem with me. Well, I wonder how she feels about her esteemed leader, the leader of the loyal opposition, promoting the use of safe supply at Christmas time by um, showing a video of mixing a drink with Crown Royal. Mm -hmm. And we still don't know what he was doing in that diagonal friendly trailer when he came out way more disheveled yeah. than he was going in. Just saying. Shot, 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 everybody. Shot, 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 shot. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Ah, my word. Now, the other thing, Alberta, going on, and again, Tracy Foran is involved with this one. She's literally putting her name on everywhere. this. But she basically said that, well, again, people are having that debate, right? It was a national park, so the... The, the, the federal government was responsible. And since it happened like this, uh, you know, um, Stephen Gilbo is responsible for burning down all of Jasper. Now, yeah, fortunately, yeah. all of Jasper did not burn down. Fortunately. Fortunately. Uh, but here's uh, something here. Uh, from uh, that well-known liberal rag, the National Post. Super Pro Trudeau, uh, published on July 29th, quote, this is a success. Jasper Mayer defends Park Canada over wildfire management. Jasper's mayor said Monday he rejects any suggestion that Parks Canada failed in its management of Jasper National Park against the risk of wildfire, saying their efforts resulted in 70% of the town remaining intact. Richard Ireland, whose own home was burned, so if anybody had a vested interest or some motivation to try to attack the federal government, it probably would be him, said he's heard criticism against the federal department coming from residents of Jasper, who he acknowledged are reeling from seeing a third of the town's structures being destroyed by an out-of-control wildfire last week. Quote, for anyone who might see this as a failure, I reject that premise, he told reporters during a briefing Monday. This is a success. He said people are asking why more of the force was not cleared, particularly of pine beetle dead trees, which critics suggest may have fed the wildfire. 
While officials say they played a factor, Ireland said it's simply not feasible to have cleared the area. Quote, we're talking about a stretch of land, a valley that's kilometers wide and 30 kilometers long, and it is absolutely full of pine beetle dead trees, said Ireland. There is no conceivable way to remove all of them, so we had to prepare for the eventuality of fire. Parks Canada President and CEO Ron Halpin said heavy winds and dry temperatures caused the inferno to grow quickly, adding that firefighters had to battle a fast-moving wall of flames, and uh, they said it was like over about 100 feet high when we were reporting it. Uh, that towered high above the trees that foiled regular firefighting techniques. Hallman also defended the work Parks Canada had done to date to manage the park, saying he understands people have questions and that there will be a time and place to seek answers. Destruction caused by pine beetles has been an issue in Alberta and British Columbia, have faced for years. He said, adding that it's one that Parks Canada already used prescribed burns to help remove. Quote, I'm well aware that there's a debate out there, and I'll leave that to those who are interested in having that, Hallman said. <laughs> in other words, F off. Mm -hmm. Over the past decade, he says Parks Canada has lit 15 prescribed burns in Jasper, burning thousands of hectares in the park alone. Hallman added that over his 30-year career as a public servant, where he has worked for 12 different ministers under four different prime ministers, the issue around the risks posed by the pine beetles has never been politicized. Again, 30-year career. We're talking to people who know what they're talking about here, rather than Sunday morning armchair bitchy quarterbacks. Yeah. who are hyperpartisan and have vested interests in wanting to point us to the person to whom we should blame and then ask us to unload on them. No, um, we take the safety of everyone very seriously, he said. No injuries or fatalities were reported from the blaze, which entered the town last Wednesday, with officials saying 70% of its structures were saved. Ireland underscored how all visitors and residents of the town were able to be brought to safety. Quote, I reject entirely any suggestion that there is a failure here, he said. Most of our town was spared. Environment Minister Stephen Gelbo says all the fires in the community have been extinguished and that crews are working to return power to the town and planning a, quote, staged re-entry for its residents, but have no timelines yet. Planning for re-entry must be done carefully, given officials warned that upcoming weather conditions created a heightened fire risk and the fact there are wildfires burning within the park, which threatens the community, the minister added. Okay. So, according to the mayor, and he's the one that's the best place to know, because his town is in the park, so he must deal with Parks Canada all the time. Yes. Things were done well. <laughs> the guy from Parks Canada who's been doing this for 30 years mm -hmm. under 12 different ministers, four different prime ministers. The job was done well. So can we shut up? I, I would People hope. did the best they could with what they had. Yeah. All and right. considering when the fire hit the town, people were leaving and they said, Jasper's gone. They thought it would all be wiped out. And 70% of the town was safe. And there were no fatalities, either in residents or hikers. And we're even seeing now uh, through uh, Par Parks Canada, through the Jasper Park, they're showing images of wildlife that had been tagged, that they were able to go back and look at the monitoring and tags and see where the animals went to save themselves and protect themselves. We're getting this data now. So stop it. Mm. Stop trying to insinuate, suggest, infer, say, whatever synonym you want to use. This, I like that, cinnamon on my toast. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> that people. <laughs> I had to. I, lo I love this, this, this thesaurus. It gives me all the cinnamons. <laughs> <laughs> Stop trying to suggest that there was someone of ill intent that was either neglectful or deliberately tried to set some fire. I guess, or had depraved indifference at the risk of fire, who didn't care enough about the town or human life or whatnot to do all that they could. There is one person, however, that did, could have done more, that didn't. And that's the premier. Because she cut budgets. Yeah. And in January, she was warned by the firefighters Hey, water tables are down. We didn't get a lot of rain. We're going to have trouble this summer. 
in February, she has warned. He says, well, we met with the minister, um, and he said some good things, but um, he didn't seem to have any plans, any details, and whatnot. Like I said, we need those. 60 days before, she was warned. Yeah. Did nothing. On the 9th of July, there's that fire map that we keep on showing you. Everybody goes, at any time now, it's just going to go poof. Just going to, any time, it's going to go poof. It is so dry. Just go poof, anywhere. And it happened. And it wasn't until then it was happening, and it happened for a while, this, that she asked for help. But not before. Chastising. People for putting out the emergency warning. She actually accused people of spreading misinformation. CTV. Alberta's premier says changes are needed to the province's emergency alert system after incorrect information was shared about the Jasper evacuation on Monday night. This is July 23rd. An emergency alert communication from the province at 10.18 p.m. indicated the wildfire south of the community would reach the town in five hours. At 11.09, not even an hour later, the following update is posted. The fire is not expected to reach the community in five hours. The town should be evacuated. Uh, it's just... Daniel Smith said the information came directly from the town of Jasper, and it's the first time the town had used the system. We may need just to have an additional step just to make sure that when information is going out, it's communicated accurately so it doesn't cause that kind of panic, she told reporters, adding she was frightened and stressed by the first message. There's a screenshot of an Alberta, Alberta emergency alert that was posted as part of the Jasper wildfire evacuation that's in the article. It said, Action to take. Everyone in Jasper and Jasper National Park must evacuate now. The fire is coming towards two and is expected to reach the community in five hours. Please drive safe. Use Highway 16 towards British Columbia. Follow directions from local authorities. Bring identification, important documents, medications, and your emergency kit. Standard fare. Communications expert Dean Human says it's critical that emergency information is vetted and up-to-date, avoiding causing panic. Quote, there really are a lot of challenges at getting out good information, but vital clear information is the difference between an orderly evacuation and it could possibly be between the difference between life and death. The real challenge for all communications is misinformation and how fast it can multiply. The mayor of Jasper did not respond to CTV News Edmonton's interview requests at that time. That's on the 23rd. He had other things on his mind. <laughs> on Tuesday evening, the Alberta Emergency Management Agency said the municipality of Jasper, quote, would no longer be updating its wildfire situation via the alert system. Instead, it said people should refer to the municipality's website. Now, I don't know if the fire did hit within five hours or not. Mm. So I'd have to go back in time and, and read the articles. But seriously, after you saw the size of and the scale of the fire. You were talking about 100 foot walls of fire. And your first instinct is, after of cutting all those budgets and whatnot, it's like, oh no, don't make people panic. We need to fix that. There is one person who objectively could have done a better job. Yeah. And I won't say she caused it, Maybe none of these decisions, poor decisions, had any impact on what happened. There is a world where exists where the repellers could have still been there and the people could have been there and it might, might not have mattered. Possibly. We don't know. We can't know. So to say that she caused it was unfair. But if you want to put all the best possible odds on your side... She's not helping. No, definitely not. And then you got Doug Ford going, it's like, hey, if you need help, we'll help you. With what? You cut the wildfire service too. <laughs> Jeez. These people. But notice that the first instinct is to always grab the people, put a gun on their hand, load it, turn them towards who's to blame, and say, do your thing. And the person that they point them towards is never themselves. If we keep doing politics this way, we will have nothing but arguments and fights and violence. Mm -hmm.
if as soon as something happens, your first instinct is, how can I deflect this off me and who can I point the blame at? Where can I redirect the anger? This is not the job for you. She's just not, she's like, she's a spin doctor, nothing else. She's not a leader. She our, should not be premier. Our premiers are the problem. Yes. But, but the leader of the opposition blames everything on the federal government and the prime minister and tells him. And he's not he's had much to say either. Yeah. He's had a couple of platitude tweets. Oh, we feel really sorry, but he, he hasn't proposed anything. He hasn't committed to putting more funding. He didn't say like this, you know, this is terrible. This, we need to fund this more. We need to fund. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't asked the federal government to send resources. He hasn't asked the federal government to provide some type of emergency competence. He's done nothing. He's had two or three tweets saying, oh, we feel really sorry. Please stay safe. Thank you to the first responders. That's it. Literally b below the minimum you can do in this situation. Because the minimum that you should do is actually say something or call for something that would actually help the people that have been devastated in some way. But he's not done that because no, that's a costly social government program and he doesn't believe in those. Which he's said many times. I'm just, we need to start electing people who actually want to treat people well. Stop voting for assholes. Yeah. Mr. Grizzly, uh, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to support us, you can, thanks to the Ray Girl. There you go. That QR code will bring you to our pod page, which is sponsored by the Ray Girl. And if you go there, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words if you happen to be listening um, that will bring you to our pod page where you can click subscribe and when you do that when we have something fresh off the bandwidth in podcast form it comes directly to you if you would like to help us in other ways well then what you can do is you can make like kit elaine and surf on down to the true north eager beaver media page. Now, of course, if you're surfing, we can't guarantee you a view that's as beautiful as Tahiti, uh, but we can guarantee you that you will find some really, really fun and informative content. Well, at least we hope that you find it fun and informative content on our page. So True North Eager Beaver, closing in on 5,000 subscribers. Thank you absolutely everyone who's doing that. We really appreciate that. And if you would like, oh, and, and remember to click our buttons, like, share, and subscribe. And if you would like to help us in other ways, the QR code that's been up uh, all show, uh, that will bring you to our coffee page where you will find our tip jar. So if you appreciate the work that we do and uh, you find some value in it uh, and you would like to do us, you would like to encourage us to do more or would like to help us uh, with our costs and putting on the show, uh, we would be very grateful for any assistance you can provide. So if you scan the QR code or if you go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, all in one word, lowercase letters, uh, and make a little contribution, we would be, you will have our gratitude, definitely. Um, now, if you can't, that's okay. That's okay. People have priorities, and you want you first take care of home first. But if you can't, the gift of your attention is the one we cherish most, and we love to hear from you. So why not let us know what you think about the show or propose some story ideas. You can write to us at truenorthegerbeaver at gmail.com. You can leave a comment on our YouTube page, on our Twitter feed, at True Eager, or on our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver. We try to read absolutely everything, even if we can't always respond, but we thank you for your participation. It uh, really helps us, and it makes the show better. So, and it's your show, too. So uh, please do participate. Because democracy is something that you do. Uh, I mean, yes. I know, man. Like, I... The reason I did that is because right now things are just so damn weird. It's like there's like, it seems a little trite almost to suggest to suggest these things. But listen, it's the little things. It's the little things. Write those letters. 
I mean, there's plenty to write about. <laughs> and it's free. So write the letters. And of course, uh, we have some elections coming up uh, in uh, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick, and some by-elections coming up. So uh, there are two in by-elections. Uh, they will need some poll workers and stuff, and there will be some candidates that you can volunteer for. Uh, so please uh, get involved. All right? We really... Uh, and remember, kids and cubs, the earlier in the process you get involved, the easier it is to weed out the really bad candidates. This is very true. So that's why I'm talking about Tracy Ferran a lot. Because right now she's just a, she's not the candidate for that electoral district. She's in the race for the nomination to become the candidate. Because if she can be made unacceptable at this stage, we don't have to deal with her when she's a candidate or when she's already a potted plant in a seat where they vote for anything that would turn blue. I don't think that's the case in her writing that she's running for, but in the cases, and then you can't get rid of them at all. They're encrusted there for like for 12, 12, 15 years, like Cheryl Gallant. So deal with the problems early. Trust me. Don't just vote at the federal election. Get involved in the nomination races. That's where you weed out the trash. Not saying that Tracy Foreign is trash. I'll say it. But that is, where is. You, that is where you weed out the trash. The earlier you can get it done, the better. All right. <sighs> it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. <clears throat> Enjoy the summer. <laughs> I got Are you ready else. for the summer? I got nothing else. Are right you now. ready for I, a good time? <laughs> I need food and I need coffee. And uh, yeah, I got to I got to away from the computer for a bit. All I could think of is meatballs. <laughs> and I just watched that again recently. <laughs> when the hand goes up, the mouth goes shut. <laughs> All right, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. I, uh, I can do that for you. I just got to find it. Oh, there she is. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta show you this because. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. It's 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 tweet, and it's stop calling us weird is what the tweet is. Okay, <laughs> stop calling us no, weird, and no. then wait till you, wait till you see we this won't. photo, because I, I don't I don't weird. I don't have anything. I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Wait till you see this. Okay, here I'm going to put this on the screen. I'd like you to read it for me after you stop laughing. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> okay. First off, oh it's a picture God. of a guy with a white hat and an American flag on the front of the hat, a white trucker cap, and he has a black T-shirt that he's holding up with a picture of an AR-15. And, sir, what does oh. that say? Oh. I am, to anybody listening at home, I am so sorry that these words have to yes. come out of my mouth. I pre It's this, I, I'm like, I, I got nothing. I, 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 got nothing. I, I, I I, I, I lubricate my AR-15 with liberal cum. Okay, <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> uh, sir, well, where do you obtain that liberal ejaculate? cum? <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. Is it organic? Do you generate it by hand? 
Do you have like a lineup of like, do you have like a, 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 a sperm donation clinic where people come in and do it in a cup and leave it there for you? Or do you like to like, are you more of a hands-on? I don't, kind I don't of understand what that was. <laughs> Lubricator. But I, I, just, I, <laughs> I have I have so I many questions. I, have, no, I can't I, I I just looked at that and went. <laughs> I just how is that? This is not making see, you look tough, what, guy. File under You really didn't think that no. one through now, did you? No. <laughs> Dude, seriously, that that was not the flex you thought it was. I just I don't know. Oh my god. See, that that's what so wanting to win the mm. nanosecond. Hey, I lubricate my R15 with liberal come that's gonna sound good. It's like you never thought that people were gonna ask you where you got the I, I don't wanna know. I'm I sorry, dude. Know. It's like I'm gay. That sounds a well, little I'm, gay. Maybe he went to. Sounds where just do you collect a wee it from? Gay. You go to the local establishment, uh, like the, uh, the the local gay bar, to to get samples to loop. Like what? Oh, huh? <laughs> I mean, they could have said te- yeah, exactly, Mister Dicka. They could have said tears. Everybody was expecting tears. He zigged. We were expecting him if, to zag. If it's and photoshopped, zigged. it's a well done Photoshop. But either either way, it's like wow. <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, gets a, okay. I don't totally know the note. Get some Cubs if you want to uh, cheer on Team Canada in the three minutes. Uh, Team Canada is uh, playing water polo uh, against China, and uh, at uh, noon, a three-on-three basketball. Team Canada won its first game. Also playing China. I'm guessing that's the theme today: Canada versus China. <laughs> I don't know. It. There seems to be a country every day, uh, and there's some beach volleyball at uh, two p.m. And of course, uh, some swimming finals later on today yeah. and all that good stuff, right? So um, just rah, rah, rah. Go Canada, go. All that right. That would be a terrific day. I'll uh, see you later. <laughs>